First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. For seen in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories. Shit that works. Peace, peace. Be back once again with Dr. Aileen Bay's show. And we're going to be going over tonight, Malik El Shabazz, also known as Malcolm X assassination. And who was really behind his assassination. Um, the question that we will be asking is, was it John Ali, who was the third highest ranking member of the um, in the Nation of Islam under on the Elijah Muhammad? We know that John Ali was an FBI informant and possibly even an agent, allegations in which that he's never denied. Or was it Minister Farrakhan um, in which that was at the Newark Mosque the night before those assassins left out in order to go and assassinate Minister Malcolm X. All right? Um, Nevertheless, he has admitted that he may have set the climate for the assassination, meaning um, with his verbal slander and death threats, you know. However, he has stated on several occasions that he had nothing to do with it. Or was it simply the case of four religious zealots, possibly five or six, as we'll get into tonight, with names. You know, on the rampage, angry at uh, Malcolm, public blog broadcast of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's extramarital affairs and alleged children out of wedlock. Of course, you know, these are terms, um, European terms, in order to get us angry at one another. You know, but uh, we will be going into that tonight. I'm getting ready to bring my special guests on. Brother Big Man, are you here? Greetings, peace, brother. Big man, you here? Brother, big man. Brother, big man, are you on the line? Do you hear me? Yes, I can, brother, big man. There we go. We got you now. All right. All right, all right. Um, you know what's the topic for tonight. And um before we get into it, I just want to say that um that um, one of the daughters of um, Malcolm X, Malika, um Shabazz, you know, Malak, she just came out, she was one of the twins in which they actually was in the stomach or the belly of um you know, of um, Malcolm's wife or Betty Shabazz, you know, when Malcolm got shot 
and she stated on the record that um, Louis Farrakhan, FBI, CIA, and the NOI killed Malcolm X. You know, matter of mm-hmm. fact, there's an article that just came out um, actually today, as a matter of fact, Brother Big Man. And this is what it says. It says the FBI, CIA, the Nation of Islam, and Louis Farrakhan were responsible for the death of Malcolm X. The charges was levied over the weekend by Malcolm's ex's daughter, Malek um, Shabazz, and the interview was Sahara TV. She said that her family members were completely settled on the fact that the NOI conspired with the FBI and CIA to kill her father, Malcolm X. It says the Nation of Islam, were they involved? This was a question that was asked. She said, she said absolutely. Um, was Farrakhan involved? Absolutely. Um, he was also involved with the CIA, FBI, and everybody else. This is what she said. Shabazz goes on to say, with confidence that Sahara TV, um, Rudolph um, Okonowo, he states, yes, he, Farrakhan, was, and he know it, we know it, and everybody else who was around during that time know it too, she continues to say. All right, now she also goes on, that um, it goes on to state that in 1960s, Farrakhan developed a strong um, imitacy or imitant, um, enmity, excuse me, towards fellow NOI member Malcolm X. Of course, we know the reason was behind that. Who backed a more moderate version of the so-called black civil rights um, than the Farrakhan? Um, when Malcolm, in 1964, publicly revealed the NOI leader Elijah Muhammad had impregnated several of his teenager, um, teenage secretaries, um, and told it was nine, allegedly, and Farrakhan outraged at what he perceived to be Malcolm's disloyalty, called him a traitor and denounced him in the NOI newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. And it stated, only those who wish to be led to hell or to their doom will follow Malcolm. The, the die is cast, all right, or is set, excuse me, the die is set, and Malcolm shall not escape, especially after such evil, foolish talk as his benefic- benefactory, such as a man is worthy of death, and would have been met, and would have been met his death. It has not been for Muhammad's confidence in Allah and victory over his enemies. Um, ten weeks later, on February the 21st, of course, 1965, Malcolm um, X was killed in a Harlem Audubon ballroom by three gunmen. At least this is what is stated. But of course, we know that two of them, and was that they caught later um, after the assassination, Thomas Hagen. Um, actually was the only one that they actually caught. There was a second man in which that um, has been speculated to have been Gene, Rob- um, um, Gene Roberts, who later on, um, you know, we find out um, was boss, you know, um, you undercover. know cover, undercover as well as also mm-hmm. um, later on um, COINTELPRO, CIA, um, FBI, CIA. Um, so um, let's get into um, some of that information, Brother Big Man, because yeah. we got a lot to um, cover here. Yeah, what I want to do first, mm-hmm. I want to pay homage to the ancestors. No doubt. Because I truly believe I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the ancestors and the good brothers and sisters who have helped me through the years. I want to dedicate what I'm going to say to my teacher who I met when I was like 13 years old. A lot of the people who are here now who might even listen to this program might not know him, but his name was Edward Davis, and he was a street speaker. The next person I want to dedicate what I'm going to say is to Brother Steve Coakley, who, when I was at the age of 45, he taught me so much at the age of 45 that it was just a, a new light, new information coming in, and since he has, I won't even say died, I said since he was mysteriously murdered, mm-hmm. seems like nobody want to talk about Brother Steve Coakley. Be definitely and up. the next person I want to dedicate, this is to Brother Malcolm X, who opened up my eyes at a young age, too, and who believed in telling the truth regardless where the chips may fall. So, I'm ready, brother. All right. 
All right, so we know that, um, I guess we're going to go back to Iraq around the um, early 1990s, um, as well as, you know, the atmosphere around the whole thing. But there's just pieces of the puzzle that we definitely want to get into. Like, for example, um, as recently as 1993, um, Minister Farrakhan tried to justify Malcolm X's um, assassination when he said that in the speech, was Malcolm your traitor or ours? And if we dealt with Malcolm like a nation deals with a traitor, what the hell business of it is yours? A nation has to be able to deal with traitors and cutthroats and turncoats. All right. Now, we, um, for those who do know, we often know that that was the speech. Um, in May 1995, however, Farrakhan spoke for the first time in a repentant tone about the slain and admitted that he had helped create the atmosphere or the mm-hmm. climate in which that led to it. And that he, um, he also stated that, you know, um, that he might, you know, that he's been complicit in his words that he has spoke leading up to 21st of February 1965. Mm-hmm. Um, he also stated that I acknowledge that and regret that any words that I have um, said caused the loss of life of a human being. Mm-hmm. Now, he has stated that, so we have to get it from both sides here. Now, immediately yeah. thereafter, however, he named that the United States government as the real villains that had, um, you know, the zeal and the bitterness, you know, that, that basically, you know, caused that inside of the mm-hmm. nations of Islam ranks because there was there was spies there from the F, from the FBI informants and et cetera. You know. Mm-hmm. Um you know that when Malcolm was murdered, Elijah Muhammad called him a, a hypocrite and said that Malcolm got just what he preached. You know, violence begat violence. Mm-hmm. You know, and then um, we know that Malcolm separated from the nation after learning about the corruption um, of the um, personal behavior and hypocrisy, as he was stated, you know, of Elijah Muhammad, um, who had engaged with the sexual relations with at least nine teenage women in the organization. Um, some was underage, as um, it has been stated, and, of course, we know that Elijah Muhammad then organized um, a humiliating internal trial and suspended the women from membership after several had became pregnant, you know. So, um, yeah. do you have any what, what I would like to do, what I would like to do is go back. All right. In, in order to understand what happens in the present, you have to go back to the past. So I want to go back to the 1960s when uh, Brother Malcolm was one of the most powerful speakers in America. And John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, Malcolm called it a case of chickens coming home to roost, which was correct. But Mr. Muhammad gave Malcolm and all the ministers strict orders to don't say anything about the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, One of those reasons was we know how crazy white folks can get over their heroes and leaders. So Mr. Muhammad, from what I was told by other brothers in the Nation of Islam, wanted to protect the brothers and sisters that's on the street from any violence from the, the white kind. So given that order, I was at the Manhattan Center. Like I said, brother, you there? Yes, we here, brother, big man. We okay, here. I heard a little. Uh, I was at the Manhattan oh, Center. Oh, no, no, Malcolm, everybody else is, you, you know, others are listening I was too. at Manhattan Center when uh, Malcolm gave that speech. And he got through the speech without mentioning one thing about the assassination of Kennedy until the question and answer period came up and a reporter, a white reporter in the audience named Handler, he asked Malcolm what he thought about the assassination of Kennedy, and then that's when Malcolm went into the chickens coming home to roost. In my hand, in my hand right now, Uh I have the autobiography of Malcolm X, and... uh, The gentleman that, let me make sure, the gentleman that uh, does the introduction 
His name is Handler, too. Uh. The same guy that asked Malcolm X about the assassination of Kennedy had something to do with the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh. Now, everything Malcolm said about chickens coming home to roost, I believe he was correct. The only thing was he was given an order. And when you're given an order, when you're in an organization, you have to follow. Unfortunately, a lot of us who never been in an organization don't know how an organization is run. We get very emotional. And that's one of the things. I have many tapes showing Brother Malcolm debating Cool, calm, and collective. So, he disobeyed the order. All right? Some might right. say, well, he was he was telling the truth. He was telling the truth. Right. But when you're in an organization, you it's not just one man. That's you know right. what I'm saying? Right. So, he was suspended, to my knowledge, for 90 days. Right. And he was, say, he was told not to say anything. To the press, uh, Muhammad Ali invited him down to Florida, and I saw the news that he was Brother Malcolm was still talking, and the newspaper reporters were filming. Then he came back to New York, and he had uh, a press conference at the UN. So, what I'm saying is that. I got to get back to that. When you're given an order, see, the thing about Malcolm that a lot of people don't understand, Malcolm put his brother out the nation of Islam for not doing right. Right. As well as also, um, allegedly, he put out Clarence 13X, too, who was um He put out law. Clarence 13X. Right. See, so when you get emotional and don't think and don't understand history, don't know how to go back, you just know about what's happened in 2013, but you don't know what happened in 1965. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I'm laying all this stuff out for the people that are listening to try to understand what I'm trying to get at. Right. Um, Let me say this too, so, big man, is that we know that, that it's also – that we know that Malcolm um, was often t- um, heard to say that you do not air dirty laundry before the um, before the world or before the public, but here he was, you know, um, doing the same right. thing. So um, yeah, he went against what he spoke about. He went and this is you sent me a, a tape with some Malcolm X interviews on it, uh-huh. and Malcolm said that if someone would have come to me and told me about Elijah Muhammad, he said, I would have killed them myself. Mm-hmm. Now, it's a key player. You named uh, John Ali. Right. Uh, you didn't name uh, Raymond Sharif. Right. You didn't who, name who the, who uh, Elijah the, um, Muhammad Jr. Right. Well, I'm and get a them. key player I was gonna get to them. is Wallace <laughs> A key player is right. Wallace, Wallace D. Muhammad. D. Muhammad. Right. See, when we talk about, when some people talk about Farrakhan uh, being involved in the assassination of Malcolm X and what he gained, a lot of people don't understand, because I, I was in Harlem at that time. After the assassination of Malcolm X, Farrakhan did get promoted to a position, but that position was always watched upon because the people who promoted him to that position, and I'm not talking about Elijah Muhammad. I'm talking about when Elijah Muhammad died in 1974, when Wallace took over. Right. Wallace kept a close eye on Farrakhan because he didn't want another Malcolm X. That's right. He, he moved Farrakhan from New York to Chicago to keep an eye on Farrakhan, and it was Wallace D. Muhammad who told 
Malcolm X, that his father was having uh, sex with these young secretaries. He sure did. And when Malcolm X was was assassinated, Mm -hmm. when the Muslims had their Savior's Day, Wallace Muhammad was on his knees begging to come back into the nation of Islam. Right, after the third time of being um, expelled. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I truly believe that Brother Malcolm, and this might sound rough, was conned by Wallace Muhammad. Right. Thinking right. that Wallace this Muhammad definitely. was going to stick with him this and other people. That's that why uh, Malcolm told uh, Minister Farrakhan or Louis Farrakhan at that time about what he believed that Mr. Muhammad was doing. And uh, God bless Gil Noble. Gil Noble got the tapes, brother. Gil Noble got a tape called The Death of Our Warriors. Well, Malcolm is down there on his knees begging to come back into the nation of Islam. You know what right. I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I asked Charles Kenyatta in his house if Elijah Muhammad would have told Malcolm X to come back into the nation of Islam, Malcolm would have done it. See, a lot of people don't understand one thing. Malcolm had a father, but his father was killed. Right. At a young age. That's right. When by Malcolm's KKK. father was killed, Malcolm was a, a young boy. Right. He was killed by the KKK on the um, railroad track. Right. right. And, and, we, and when when we get to the assassination of Malcolm X, I'm going to try to let the public understand that the government has been following the bloodline of the Malcolm X family for years and years and years. That's right. And to this day, the daughters, the grandsons, the nieces are always under surveillance because they are afraid of that bloodline. Right. That's right. I don't know whether you know it or not, but Malcolm X's grandson was arrested by the FBI. The same day that the Betty and Coretta movie comes on Lifetime TV or channel. Brother, nothing happens by coincidence. That's right. And it was a week and a half prior to Malcolm's assassination date, which is tomorrow, right. February the 21st. In, in February, February, every year, February, they bring up something. They don't have Mike. And unfortunately, uh, some of the, the sisters or the daughters, and I got to I can't, I can't hold my tongue. I got to say it. Some of the daughters of Malcolm X used to call Mike Wallace, Uncle yeah. Mike. Uncle Mike, right. I was at Betty Shabazz's funeral. And when the people started booing Rudolph Giuliani, Malcolm's, Malcolm's oldest daughter told them to stop booing Giuliani. Mm. So... When you tell me that, uh, not when you tell me, but when you say that one of Malcolm X's daughter says that Farrakhan was involved, uh, I I always say that how come he's not under arrest? Right. Now, you have the book, I think, called The Rise and Fall of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's right. Where it has the five names. Right. Of the people who really assassinated Malcolm X. Right, exactly. As a matter of fact. How how come the government hasn't gone after them? The, uh, see, now I got, I'm just going to read this off where the audience can get this now. I have seven books that everybody should read. The American Dictionary of Certified Uncle Tom's. The autobiography of Malcolm X, even though it's called the autobiography, uh, Alex Haley was in cahoots with the government. A lot of the things that were supposed to be in the book was taken out of the book, and a lot of things were put in the book that Malcolm did not believe in. Right, three chapters the, at least was taken out. Right, and the all next, more book, the next, mainly. right, right. The next book is. Betty Shabazz, Surviving Malcolm X. The next book is Malcolm X, A Life of 
Reinvention? Now, a lot of people are raising hell about that book. Mm-hmm. But all the people that's raising hell about it don't mention that uh, Manly Marble mentions the people who ridiculed Malcolm X and got their pictures in the damn book. Mm-hmm. And when you look at... Uh, when you look at the information, the index, this book, brother, has so much information that all that other crap that people are raising hell about, not that they shouldn't, but the book has so much good information. You who have computers, if you would go into this book and tap some of this stuff out, you would go to New Jersey and hunt, if that nigga really did it, you would hunt that nigga down. Nobody's saying they're having all these book parties and things and talking about the book is bad, but nobody said, look at here. Manny Marble says that this guy is one of the guys that really shot Malcolm X. Dick Gregory said it. I got a, a newspaper article with the guy's picture. So... If you don't know your history, brother, you repeat it. Uh, Minister Farrakhan, when he was, when he, when he broke away from Wallace D. Muhammad, Wallace D. Muhammad's, uh, uh, what did they used to call it? The Alien or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't you know Minister Farrakhan almost went crazy? Yeah. Minister Farrakhan grew an afro. I saw so, him walking okay. down 125th Street, smoking right. started, cigars. Started smoking, right. Mm-hmm. Smoking reefer. Mm-hmm. He went down, and the only thing that brought him back up was his belief in the honor of Elijah Muhammad. Right. And two or, three, two or three brothers got with him. And the reason why Minister Farrakhan is alive today and Malcolm is not, is because Farrakhan learned from Malcolm. Don't forget, Malcolm told Farrakhan in a car one day, they was in a car, and Malcolm told Farrakhan, brother, I hope, I wish I could be learning from your mistakes, but maybe you can learn from mine. Mm -hmm. And one thing Farrakhan did, which was so intelligent, he didn't say a damn thing until he got an army. Right. He kept his mouth closed. Mm -hmm. And when he had an army backing him up, then he came out swinging. Mm -hmm. See, people don't know. Malcolm only had a few real brothers with him. Right. And eventually those brothers were locked up and put in jail. Those brothers' legs were broken. Those Some of those brothers were killed. So when Malcolm was assassinated at the All the Bond Ballroom, most of them, I got to say, most of them niggas was chumps that was guarding Malcolm. That's why they ran and jumped on the floor under the tables. Malcolm didn't have no damn bodyguards because they left the podium. It's just like a quarterback. What do you call the guys that guard the quarterback? Right. Defensive linemen. What's that again? The defensive lineman. Defensive lineman. Mm-hmm. Well, Malcolm didn't have no defensive lineman because they ran. They said they went to see what was happening in the back, but when you're on post, you don't leave your post. Mm-hmm. So in other words, if those guys didn't leave those posts, those other guys up front couldn't come up there and just shoot Malcolm like he was a damn uh, uh, duck or something like that at a – Amusement park. That's right. And another thing, I've been to the Audubon many times. I didn't know Malcolm on a personal uh, level. I knew him just like I knew uh, Dr. Ben or Dr. Clark or Steve Coakley shaking their hand, talking to him. That's how I knew Malcolm in person at the age of 14 or 15 years old. But I've been in the Audubon. 
the men who assassinated Malcolm X, brother, knew that they could get away. No doubt about it. It was a setup, brother. Right. Well, let's go into that because we know that there was an affidavit sworn by um, Tal Bitch Hayo, who was known as Thomas Hagen, who was right. um, the one who actually shot Malcolm, who was caught. Um, with the 45 um, concerning his role in the assassination of Malcolm, and it was dated the 30th day of November 1977. And William, um, um, what's his name? Um, Kensler, um, Kensler, the, um, um, he was, uh, you know, he was the one who was like one of the head, um, I guess you could say lawyers or attorneys in the um, country. William Kensler, William Kensler, right? William right, Kensler, right? Um, right. Um, he had him. He had Thomas Hagen to actually do sworn affidavits. It was two of them. Um, okay. In the surviving, um, but it speaks of the surviving four of the Newark Five, as they was known: Benjamin Thomas, Leon Davis, Wilbert McKinley, and William Bradley. You know, these was all known as Benjamin X, um, Leonard X, William right. uh, um, Wilbur X, William X. You know, um, you know, they was the assassins who pulled out the gauges or the Lugers and so forth and so on and shot Malcolm along with Thomas Hager. And they was actually um, expecting that Linwood X, you know, um, um, a Linwood 25X also played a part. He was the observer during the right. run of the killing. So actually it was about six of them in total. Right. You know, and um, four of them are still living. Yeah. And another you know, well, thing, five, brother, you... Me, five of them yeah. are still living. Yeah. Another thing you Thomas mentioned... Hager, Oh, I was getting ready to say Thomas Hagen was just released out of prison not too long ago and walked the street of Harlem. You know the sad thing about that? That he could come into a meeting, a so-called conscious meeting, and nobody would know him. Yeah. But I got his picture. I know what he looked like. I know what he looked like. But uh, another thing is that uh, we know about Gene Roberts. Right. Gene Roberts' wife was also an agent. Mm-hmm. And I sent you a picture of a man called John Shabazz. Right. He went with Malcolm to uh, King's Church down in Atlanta. Right. And uh, I kind of knew him personally, too. And he turned out to be an agent. Mm-hmm. And uh, Malcolm's organization was riddled. With agents. With agents. Not yeah. just Gene Roberts right. and a few other brother. They did a job on my brother Malcolm. Uh, I'm looking at going back to the bloodline. All of Malcolm's brothers are dead. I think he had four brothers. All of them are dead. Right. His sister is dead, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, when they did a profile on Malcolm, going back to his father, isn't it ironic that the Klan uh, set fire to uh, Malcolm's father's house, and Malcolm's house was burnt? Mm-hmm. Malcolm's father was assassinated. Malcolm was assassinated. Right. Matter of fact, let's, let's, let's look at that too, Brother Big Man, because we know that um, people don't know that Malcolm's father was a Garveyite. He was part true. of the UNIA, the University of United Nations. And his mother was a secretary. Right, was the secretary, right, United um, Negro Improvement Association um, under um, um, Marcus Messiah Garvey. Now, the interesting thing about that is that his father was also a Baptist minister. That's true. So there was no, these, these were not no punk um, preachers and pastors and reverends during this time period. Well, it's just like Nat Turner. Right. But that's why I get a kick out of some people when they they talk about, you know, the church and stuff like that. But then I find out that back in slavery time, a lot of the churches was the Underground Railroad. And I find out that in the 90s in Harlem, uh, where they had First World, that was a church. Uh, The monsters wouldn't uh, bury Malcolm or have the funeral. Charles Baptist Church uh, let Malcolm be funeralizing it in a Christian church. Mm-hmm. So you can't just talk and talk and talk and don't know, excuse the line, what the hell is going on right in front of you, brother. That's right. Like I'm, now I'm, I'm down here now, 
And that's a whole story. But I met, and, and not only down here, but all my life, brother, when I was on the streets, I knew Muslims, Christians, Moors, Hebrews, niggas that didn't even believe in God. And I used to get along because I would listen and try to learn, you know. And uh, that's why when I look at a lot of these uh, debates, man, I think it's like uh, kin- kindergarten school. Uh, Malcolm would debate. You never hear Malcolm calling the person that he's debating a nigga, calling him out of his name. So the language that we use today has even changed, and it's more emotions, emotional. You're not getting at the facts. You're getting emotional. And the reason why I spoke on those books, and I have uh, another one, To Kill a Black Man by Louis Lomax, and Temple Number 7, Temple number seven by mm-hmm. Minister Jane Seven X. Right. That's a good book too. Let, so, let me say this, let me say this, brother Big Man, about um about about um Lewis um E. Lomax. Um right. the interesting thing is that Carl Evans, who was the um staff writer for the um Washington Post, he researched more than three hundred thousand pages of declassified FBI and CIA documents right. um, for his book, which that was called The Judas Factor. Um you know, um, he was as well as also Louis L- um, Lomax was convinced, you know, that um, that Malcolm was set up, you know, for the assassination by John Ali, who was an okay, agent right. former for the intelligence um, agency or COINTELPRO, right. and that Malcolm had previously commented that Ali had been responsible for him being oust from the NOI. And, you know, right. because he was the one who controlled the newspaper as the secretary. Information. Information. Right, the information. So Ali... Um, eventually rose to the position of National um, Secretary of the NOI, which was actually the third ranking higher member behind Herbert Muhammad and and um, Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. You know, so we found out that Louis Lomax was later killed in an automobile accident, supposedly due to brake failure. You right. know, and um, and we come to find out that Thomas Hagen, you know what I'm saying, who is Thomas um or Tomich or Tomich um Hayer, actually met with John Ali the night before the Malcolm's assassination. Okay. In Newark, in Newark, New Jersey, you know, yeah, um, yeah. I'm in Newark, New Jersey. There, there are so many pieces to the puzzle. I want to read something. Uh, Percy Ellis Sutton. Right. Percy Ellis Sutton was born in San o- San o- Tan- uh, San Antonio, Texas. Mm-hmm. Right. His parents, Samuel J. Sutton and Lillian Sutton, were educators and philanthropists. Percy Sutton graduated from Phyllis Wheatley High School in San Antonio and subsequently attended Prairie View Agriculture and Medical College, Tuskegee Institute and Hampton Institute, where he attempted to join the Army Air Force in Texas during World War II. He was rejected for reasons having to do with his racial background. He then successfully enlisted in the New York one second. He successfully enlisted in the New York as an intelligence officer Mm. with the black ninety nine fighter swat. I had to get that straight because uh, I read this, but I didn't read that he was an intelligent officer for the Black 99 Fighter Squadron serving in the Italian Mediterranean Theater. This is what I was talking about here. After the war, Sutton completed his education under the GI Bill, graduating from Brooklyn Law School in 1950 during the Korean War Sutton re-entered the Air Force as an intelligence officer. Mm. Percy Sutton was an intelligence officer, and they're always bragging that Percy Sutton was Malcolm's 
lawyer. Lawyer. No wonder the damn government knew so much about Malcolm X. Exactly. Now, now, big brother, big man, were you at um, the Betty Shabazz and the um, Minister Farrakhan, the new beginning at the Apollo Theater, May 6, 1995? I, I didn't make that, but I know, I know about that. Right now, now Percy Sutton was there, and she gave right. you know um, praise basically to Sutton for helping the family out during you know after the death of Malcolm. Now, also, you know Betty was still in the mode of um, you know somewhat you know, blaming Farrakhan for the death of Malcolm. So there was some little slick things in which that was said about it, you know. Um, but when people go back and watch this YouTube clip or the video, DVD or whatever the case is, um, they would see something very interesting in which that she makes mention of. She makes mention of the fact that um, Malcolm came out of prison with four moths already under Oh, yeah? Belt. Right. And she said... You know, and then, um, of course, you know, through his help, you know, put a mosque throughout almost every state in the nation. Right. You know, and so they have to, and she was saying that they need to recognize him for doing so and stop trying to, you know, hide that history or take mm. that away from him, you know, because, um, you know, that's the truth of the matter, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Mm-hmm. there's no doubt that Malcolm X, Help build the nation of Islam, right? To to be in one of the most powerful organizations that there is in the black community, mm. but at the same time, there was a nation of Islam foundation that was there when Malcolm X was selling drugs and doing what he was doing in the street. Right. So you give credit where credit is due on on both sides. If there wasn't a nation of Islam. Malcolm wouldn't have had a platform right. to speak on. No doubt. And I always say it's great to have a, a black general, but when you got an army, you got to understand one thing. The man in the kitchen who's cooking, in my opinion, is just as important as the man that's up there speaking. True indeed. Because our army runs on a full stomach. The nurses, the doctors, the janitor, the brothers that set up the damn uh, uh, chairs, the brothers that stand on security are just as important. So there was an organization in place when Malcolm came on the scene. Right. No doubt. No doubt about that. Um, let's let's get into this lineage thing, too, because, um, like you said, Malcolm's daughters um, in particular, um, we know that Kabila – um, was supposedly was set up by uh, Michael um, um, Fitzpatrick. Patrick, right, who was um, Cointel Pro, or FBI agent himself, right. in which that, you know, um, he was known for um, several bombings around the world, in which that he's supposed to have been funded by Kabila Paid um, in order to assassinate Minister Farrakhan, in which that she later goes, um, you know, to jail. And of course, based on Minister Farrakhan coming forth and not pressing charges, she was released. But, of right. course, within a matter of months, the same year of 1995, um, Betty Shabazz has to appear with Minister Farrakhan at that um, 1995 um, Apollo Theater meeting. You right. Know? Um, so that was no coincidence. Um, she had to um, do that based on the fact that um had to show, you know, connection and show, um, you know, even though just two years prior to um, it was on a TV show, you know, like you said, um, they refer to uh, Mike Wallace as Uncle Mike, as well right. as also on another TV show in which that they played a clip of Malcolm X um, um, of his assassination and Minister Farrakhan saying um, about, you know, if he was our traitor, then what hell, right. um, hell yeah. what business of it is yours? And she sits there, you know, you know, like with a grin on her face like, mm, well, you know, this is, um, you know, do you believe that, you know, the question was asked, do you believe that Minister Farrakhan has something to do with it? And she said yes. Absolutely, right. and then she goes on to say that um, based on that, you know, not only do she believe it, but that was a badge of honor among uh-huh. members of the Nation of Islam during that time period. Now, another important thing was that Malcolm's ex-daughter was arrested right after the time of Malcolm's assassination. This is another daughter. This is uh, Malika. This is one of the twins. You know, right. I read I read the article earlier of Malek. Malek is her is her um, twin sister. 
Mm-hmm. This is Malika. Now, Malika, she was arrested right in North Carolina, Mars Hill, North Carolina. And um, she was the daughter, you know, um, um, arrested, in, and she was held in North Carolina jail and could be um, basically, I guess, taken back to New York for to face charges on several what outstanding warrants. What was she arrested warrants. for? For several outstanding warrants, that's okay. it. Outstanding warrants. They never said what the warrants were about or anything in the article. But guess what? Mm-hmm. That was Saturday, February the nineteenth. And guess when the article came out? February the twenty first. Mm-hmm. The day, and that was two thousand eleven. That was just two years ago. Right. You know, so that's the yeah. ritual. February two um twenty first, the day in which that Malcolm was assassinated. The day in which that that article comes out, in which that they arrest. Uh, Malcolm's daughter two years ago, and here it is, Kabila's son, you know, um, who was known as Malik Shabazz the second, or right. Malik Shabazz Jr., you know, he gets arrested a week and a half or so ago, you know, for trying to go to Iran. Right. And the FBI stops him the same day the movie Betty and Coretta comes out on Lifetime right. Channel. Yeah. Nothing Nothing happens by accident. Right. Uh, I, I'm sitting here... Looking at uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz's uh, memorial services at Riverside Church, June 29th, 1997, Uh and I'm looking at the program, and the reason why I'm saying this is that if people don't know certain things and they just assume, uh, where they say acknowledgments, all these men got up and spoke about how much they cared for Betty Shabazz and how much they cared for the Malcolm X family. But if you know the history of these men, you say, damn, how did that happen? Right. Abe Beam, former mayor Abe Beam, New York City, former mayor Ed Koch, New York City, Right. former mayor Rudolph Giuliani, New York City, Alex Herman, U.S. Secretary of Labor. The only person here is Maxine Waters that might have had some uh, real caring about the Shabazz family. Right. Robert H. Shula, minister of the uh, Crystal Cathedral. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. How do these people get on the program and Dr. Ben is not on the program? Right. How do these people get on the program and Dr. Clark is not, well, I think Dr. Clark was dead then, but how come Dr. J is not on the program? No, because she passed in 97. Um, John Henry Clark didn't pass until 98, a year later, if I'm not mistaken. So okay, you're right, brother, but, big man. Yeah. So what was happening? Right. That's why when you had first started, you were saying, one of Malcolm's daughters said uh, that she knows Farrakhan did this. Right. You hanging out with crackers like this? <laughs> right. Rudolph Giuliani, Ed Koch, B. Mm-hmm. To me, that makes your, um, what's that word? <laughs> anyway, to me, uh, credibility. Right. You can't be hanging out with these guys. Right. And telling me about Farrakhan. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Because I was one of the vendors on 125th Street when Rudolph Giuliani brought over five or 6,000 police, man. Right. And was whipping heads, locking brothers and sisters up, taking our livelihood away. And you're going to tell me some stuff like that? Mm Mm-hmm. But if you don't know, you don't know. Then you don't know and you can't show. That's true. Right. So as we were saying, Dr. Betty Shabazz, she died in 1997, of course, due to burns sustained when her house was set on fire, allegedly right. by her grandson. Now, Brother Steve right. Coakley um, did, a, um, um, did um, a tape actually um, on um, Betty Shabazz, and he called it actually an assassination of that bloodline once again, in which okay. they stated that there was three white assailants in which that Betty was making mention of, but yet it was never brought up. Right. You know, so I don't know if these three white um, individuals were actually, you know, COINTELPRO and, like you said, was spying on them, keeping tabs on them, um, or whatever the case may be. We know that um, Malik Shabazz, you know, young um, Malcolm, as they refer to him as, 
or Malcolm's grandson was going back and forth, being that, you know, Kabila was not stable at the time and allegedly was on drugs. Um, he was going back and forth, you know, from house to house, and eventually, you know, Grandma said, okay, well, he come and live with me. You know, and um, being disappointed the fact that he couldn't see his grandmother based on what he has stated, you know, right. um, he was playing with fire, you know, um, and ended up, you know, um, setting the house on fire. And, and, of course, she trying to save him. She walks through the fire and get 98% of her body burned out. Right. Mm-hmm. And then dies weeks later um, within the hospital. That's something else, ain't it? Yeah, that is something else. Yeah. Uh, when I was mentioning uh, M.S. Handler, he does the introduction in the book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, right. the same guy that asked Malcolm that question right. about so Kennedy's like assassination. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, those in the audience, if they don't really have it, they should get that dictionary certified Uncle Tom's because – They have a whole list of agents from the days of Marcus Garvey on up to what's happening now who betrayed and set up. uh, They name them. Uh, Just like Steve Coakley said, naming the names. Right. They name the names. Right. Do you have that list, Brother Big Man, on you? Uh, As we talk, I'm looking through it, and I'll find it in a minute. All right. you, You can go on and let me find that spot. All right, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to name some books also in which that they need to check out. Um, um, you want to check out The Spoken Gun, The Malcolm X Files. Um, it's not necessarily a book, but you can actually find that on the Internet. Um, the Judas Factor by Carl Evans. Um, of course, you want to watch Betty and Coretta on Lifetime Channel. Check that right. out. In order to, um, FBI Files. Right. You also want the FBI Files. You want the conspiracy to plot the plot to kill Malcolm X by Zach um, Kondo, in which that, right. you know, prior to um, Manly, um, Man in um, Marble's um, book um, probably was the most complete book on the subject. Um, you want The Assassination of Malcolm X by Peter Goldman. You want, um, of course, articles from the Muhammad Speaks dating back to December 1964, um, in which that was an article um, by Louis Farrakhan. You want The Emerge magazine, March 1992, uh, with the cover on um, the Nation of Islam, you know, so you definitely want these particular um, books, you know, in, um, or, you know, articles or whatever the case may be, files, you know, in order to definitely check out the add to your arsenal. You got to read everything, brothers and sisters. Uh, these right. movies, you know, uh, Bobby Hemet, Phil Valentine, Brother Daoud, would always talk about these movies and not just movies. So you should go in there and with your pencil and pen and write things down because in the movie there's a message. You know what I'm saying? Right. No doubt about it. And um, another interesting point, too, for everyone is that there was FBI wiretaps, um, amongst others, of Chicago Temple Number 2, New York, um, um, Temple or Mosque number seven, Boston, um, number um, Temple or Mosque eleven, um, Philadelphia number twelve, Newark, New Jersey number twenty-five. You know, um, together with um, um, Jersey City, Patterson, and Plainville, um, these satellites and Los Angeles number twenty-seven telephone conversations, along with clandestine recordings of speeches covering at least the period from 1962 to 1966, you know. So they knew, and guess what? Um, it should be declassified and released to in, um, investigators as these temples were notorious for their deprived and murderous attitude towards Malcolm X, you know, so or, or Malik El-Hajj, um, or El-Hajj Malik El-Shabazz. Now, um, we know that Newark Temple number 25 was where was the... Um, was the temple in which that these particular assassins left out from. So um, we definitely would need those recordings in order to find out what was being said um, around the time leading up to uh, February the 21st, 1965, you know. Um, so, we, you know, there's just some things that we definitely have to um, definitely investigate um, even further. You know, there's another um, publication known as The Man Who Did Not Shoot Malcolm X, and of course, you know, 
um, there was two brothers who actually went to jail. Um, Muhammad right. Abdul Aziz, who was known as Norman um, 3X Butler, um, and it says that besides becoming the second-ranking official at the Mosque Number no. 7, uh, which is also the former temple of Malcolm X, Minister Farrakhan, as well as also Dr. Khaled Muhammad, as well as also um, Ben Chavis, if I'm not mistaken, actually was over it too, in which that Farrakhan wanted, um, um, in which that um, was stated that um, by Charles 37X or Kenyatta, in which that stated that Minister Farrakhan wanted Malcolm's spot. Um, there is no uh-huh. question about it. He wanted Malcolm's spot. Now, he has said that, but that still doesn't um, go into the fact of um, everything in which that has been said. There still need to be more investigation. But it also says that who, um, that um, Muhammad Abdul um, Aziz or Norman 3X Butler, he was actually paroled in 1985 after 20 years in prison, but also maintained that he had nothing to do with Malcolm's murder. Um, right. He was the chief of security and training for the sect um, within um, Nation Islam East Coast region which included dozens of mosques from Maine to South Carolina. Um, yet, you know, when he was, um, um, yet when he was um, the head or being um, appointed over the Mosque 7, he did state, Khalil said um, that, what a matter of fact irony. They gave me the star role, the man with the shotgun, the mastermind. All right, now, even mm-hmm. though he said that he had nothing to do with the um, with the shooting, of Malcolm, you know, at the Audubon, you know, ballroom. But when he gets out of prison, Minister Farrakhan puts him in a position to head um, the mosque number seven. As you know, you was there during that time period in Harlem, um, Brother Big Man. What was your feelings um, about that, and what was the word or the consensus on the street? Yeah. Well, the part that you were talking about, they made, gave me the star road. I don't know about that part. But what I do know, because I... After he got that appointment, uh, him and around 200 FOIs were on 125th Street. And uh, they passed by my stand, and I took pictures. Unfortunately, I don't have some of those pictures now. He even shook my hand, right? Right. Now, that, to my knowledge, the only thing that I can say is that I think that he did 20-something years, right? Him right. and the other brother. The other brother, right. the other he just brother died was a couple of years ago. Right, Thomas 15X um, Johnson. No right, I met Khalid uh, Islam. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Khalid Islam used to buy books from me. Right. And uh, I've met both of them. Uh, that appointment was, to my knowledge, from uh, a man that did 20 years, and was innocent, number one. That's the that's the ironic part. You know, like, right. if he was really, like this other nigga, Hagen, I mean, if Hagen, he was right. really the killer and mm-hmm. he was appointed, then that would be a whole different thing right. in, in my, my eyesight. Uh, I finally found that page, and I just want to read something. This is out of the certified Uncle Tom's, all the agents that were not only in America, but around the world. It took hundreds of black skin sabotagers to operate the FBI's COINTEL pro operation. It says hundreds, but it was thousands. Mm. Which target for destruction every notable black leader and organization in the fight for racial justice. They infiltrated, surveilled, sabotaged, undermine black organizations at the behest of the greatest, now this is my words, the greatest white faggot in America, J. Edgar Hoover. For example, throughout the 1960s, between 60 and 70 Negro agents had infiltrated the Black Panther Party on behalf of the FBI. They were used in launching a series of, of illegal operations against the Panthers as part of a successful operation to neutralize. When you hear that word neutralize, that means kill. Right. Many other organizations were 
undermined, and ultimately were destroyed by these black agents of repression, mm, so which, made, mm -hmm. which made a lucrative career out of this most insidious form of Uncle Thomism. Right, now, this is me, the part right here. Right, let me say this Throughout me Algeria, mm -hmm. Kenya, and Tanzania, black agents polled posed as hotel operators, poets, journalists, mingled with Africans and black citizens, and filed their reports with the CIA headquarters. So preserved was their poisonous presence in the motherland that an aqua Ghana signs were posted around the city that read, Beware of Afro-Americans. Over 3,000 illegal operations worldwide, largely in the third world nations. The CIA has recruited, recruited willing Uncle Tom Negroes to carry out its deeds. Now, this is under infiltrators, agents, and provocateurs. George right. Sam. Black Panther Party official, paid FBI informer, killed a party member. James A. Harrison, FBI code name, AT1387-S, became a controller of Martin Luther King's Southern Leadership Conference and supplied information to the FBI. William O'Neill. FBI infiltrator who became high official in the Black Panther Party supplied floor plans for the police raid that killed Mark Clark Drugs. and Fred Hampton and, Fred Hampton. and put right. drugs in, in Mark cool Clark's and right. Fred Hampton's drink. Right, in the cool air. And mm -hmm. he received a total of $30,000 for his services, and they gave the nigger a bonus of $300. Mm. Now, I can go on. I don't want to take up too much time, but there's one more I'm going to read here. Gene Roberts, we right. know about Let's him and Malcolm. About, right, but he also was on the. But he also was on the. Um, he testified um, because he became also part of the New York Twenty One. He and he testified. Oh yeah, right, right, right. 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 So got Gene, to, Gene Roberts. Gene Roberts was first in the Nation of Islam. Then he got it to Malcolm, and then he hooked up with the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. Gene Roberts went from from organization to organization. Right. He was the super Negro um, co-intel right. Uh Merrill McCullough. Oh, yeah. We know Memphis him. Police under, Memphis police undercover agent surveilling Martin Luther King was posing as an activist right. when the United the States invaders. government murdered King. McCullough mm -hmm. was on the damn... Uh, balcony when King got shot. Right, and that's what the one who made this, them this point. is the point. Mm -hmm. Now he works for the CIA. That's right. Uh, the brothers and sisters need to get this book because there's so much information in it. They you can go on, brother. All right, all right. So um, we definitely know that these individuals are part of it. We know the psychosis of it, black mentalism. In which that is also known as post traumatic syndrome or mental side. Right. Also known as the Willie Lynch syndrome. It goes by so many different names now. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, we keep coming up with another name every year, but um it's called a sociopath. You right. Know, an individual who don't have any remorse or have any feelings about what they do. You know what I'm saying? That's true. And is happy to do it. So these are psychopaths or sociopaths at their best. And we talking about black mm -hmm. devils. You know. Yeah. Um, these individuals are accepting, like you said, um, thirty thousand dollars and three hundred dollar bonus. Wow, happy right. Negro Day for me. You know, so yeah. you know these are the type of um, people in which that um, don't don't mind um, selling you out for um, 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 for the crumbs at the master's table. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing is that we're talking about the assassination of Malcolm X, but this goes deeper than just Malcolm. Thousands 
of black men, women, and children have been murdered. I'm looking at the article on Geronimo Pratt. Elmer G. Pratt, 63, jail panther, dead. Right. Died in uh, Africa, okay? Right. Now, only somebody who really know, knew this brother mm-hmm. knew whether the brother really had high blood pressure or was right. he sick. That's how you can kind of narrow these, or these mysterious deaths down because that brother was 63. I'm 66, right. and that brother was in good health, exercise. He was a military man, so he knew how to take care of himself, but <clears throat> never – Plus, he won $4.5 million from the federal government Right. all that time that he uh, spent in jail. You know right. what I'm saying? That's right. Forcibly so, in jail. spent in jail. That's you right. never know. You never know, brother. You know, sisters, uh, right. me and Sionetta did the last interview with Brother Barashango right. at Soul Brothers Boutique. Right. Let, let me tell you this about Brother Barashango because it was interesting because we got a call. My my teacher and I, we was in North Carolina at my bookstore, Cultural Freedom um, Bookstore, um, and this was January. I remember the day that it happened. This was like around January, the first week or so of January, and we got news. A call came through um, to um, Prince Ramesses Abel Bay or Prince Hutan Tupac Bay in which that stated that um, Ishimusha Barashango just passed. Mm. Now, this was before his actual passing date, brother big man. Ain't that something? Now, this was the crazy thing is that um, Ishimusha Barashango, um, who they mixed him up with, was actually Jacob Carruthers. Now, I don't know how you make mm. that mix up, because Jacob Carruthers passed like around January that second. But we get word of it, you know what I'm saying, a few days later, like around January the 5th. You know what I'm saying? That fifth or sixth, somewhere around there, of that, it was Ishimusha Bear Shango. But guess what? Ishimusha Bear Shango didn't pass until January the 14th. Ain't that something? And right before him, on January the 12th, my teacher passed. Right. These things are not happening by coincidence. That's no. why I, 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 I've told brothers, if, <laughs> I'm saying this jokingly, but I plan on being here many years. If they find me and I got alcohol or drugs in my system, you know that's a damn lie because I don't drink and I don't take drugs. That's right. So uh, I'm looking at um, how Brother Steve Coakley broke down the assassination of uh, Tupac and Howard Washington and Biggie Smalls, and he would have done a great job on the assassination of uh, Khalid Muhammad, but he was stopped. And uh, now we have his his mysterious death. And I had made a tape, and uh, in the future people might want that tape, but I had, on the tape, at the end of the tape, I had called out for Brother Valentine to do a thorough investigation of the... Uh, Murder of Steve Coakley, but look like me and you might have to do that, brother. You hear me? Yeah, definitely. Hello? Yes, we hear, brother, big man. No, I said, did you hear what I just said? I didn't hear that last part, that last sentence. What you saying about Steve Coakley? I said that on the tape that I gave you, let you hold. Right. At the end of the tape, I had said. I wanted Brother Valentine to do an investigation into the death of Steve Coakley. Oh, got you. I don't know whether he ever got that tape, but I said it looked like me and you might have to do that. Right, right. Well, we can also add him in because I talked to Brother Phil um, at least once or twice out um, out of, um, um, once a week or either two every two weeks. That tape that I let you hold, if you can make a copy. I can get it to him. On uh Steve Coakley and Gil Noble. And then one more thing, uh, Steve Coakley uh, died the fourth month in the 11th day. Right, 
four nine four eleven, right. Okay, now you break that down, brother. Well, you know, um, four eleven based on the phone means information. When you call four one one, um, you're trying to get information. So of course, the information man was brother Steve Coakley, and like you said, and Gil Noble and, and, Steve, and Steve Coakley Noble. died the same month. That's right, the same month. So you That's got right. two of the baddest brothers who had the information, and I don't want to be spooky. You know, some people say uh, you paranoid. Brothers and sisters, if I wasn't paranoid, I wouldn't be here now. Because you always got to be watching your back, making sure that you're eating at the right places and nobody's dropping anything in your food or your drink. I got an article here, too. Right. Same civil rights leader photographer of Martin yep. Luther King, double as FBI agent, Ernest Withers. Right, who was the first guy. Ernest Withers. Mm-hmm. The brother that took all them great pictures of Martin Luther King was That's being right. paid by the United States government in an FBI informer. So That's right. don't tell me what a Negro won't do yep. for a pork chop and a piece of bacon. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, Brother Big Man, we got a question in the chat room. They want to know what's the name of that book with all them snitches in it. Oh, the Dictionary of Certified Uncle Toms. The Dictionary of Certified Uncle Toms. This came out, uh, this came out in, uh, let me see the date. 1973. Hmm. That's why I say a lot of this information uh, is not new. It's just right. that a lot of us don't read. <clears throat> so when we do get information, it seems like it's new. That's right. But it's a good book. It's uh, it's over 400 pages. Right. Is that the only thing the person want to ask? Yeah, that was that. But we have a call um, online here. We're going to go to area code 702. Area code 702, you're on the line. Peace. Peace. 702? Area code 702, you're on the line. All right, maybe they just had their hand up, Brother Big Man. Let's go to um, okay. area code 314. Here we go, 314, you're on the line. This is Brother okay, L. Okay, get scared now. Don't get scared on us. Yeah. Yeah, right. Here you go, Brother L. Brother L, it's a peace, peace God. Peace, peace God. How you doing, Grand Sheik? How you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing fine, Brother. I've listened to you and the brother talking. I uh, thought I was already on the line, but I would care. Uh, yeah, the, everything the brother was saying, uh big man was saying, uh, I have been uh, studying and investigating on since '92, right. and uh, uh, I can say he's really, really, uh, really right on time with that. No doubt about it. Yes, sir. No doubt yes, about sir. it. Yes, sir. I can tell the brother definitely did his homework. There's no doubt well, about brother, that. Well, brother, I've been in the streets of Harlem since I was 13 years old. Okay. It's not too many people that I haven't met, you know, Dr. Ben, Malcolm Farrakhan, uh, Dr. Jeffries, Brother Smalls, Kings, Queens, I mean, the big people, the little people, the winos, the, the drug addicts, brother. Uh, I'm living in the South now, but I, I still love New York, and uh, I plan on coming up there uh, soon, you know, yeah. Okay, what, 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 what exactly made you leave New York? What's that again? What exactly made you leave New York? Economics. Okay, I got you. I understand. I heard about that in New York, uh, too. A studio <laughs> cost $1,500. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yes, sir. I heard about New York and economics. Yeah. I lived in New York 60 years, brother. You know, it had to be bad for me to leave. Right, right. Mm. 
Right. We we have some questions in the chat room, Brother Big Man. One of the questions is, why so many agents in the black organizations? Uh, what's your opinion on that? And uh, as a matter of fact, they also says, are the teachings not as powerful as the dirty money on which they're receiving? So, you know, um, we know uh, one of the things, you know, when you look at COINTELPRO, set up by Diego Hoover, you know, um, since the 1920s, he's been following uh, so-called black organizations, you know, starting with Marcus Garvey, you right. know, the more science simple of America, you know, um, all up into the 60s, 50s and 60s with um, SNCC, um, SELC, you know, the so-called Civil Rights Movement, RAM, Nation of Islam, the Black Panthers, you know, and et cetera, on and on and on. And, of course, we know that there's a memo in which that came out a month before the assassination of Martin Luther King in which that stated that they feared the rise of a black messiah who could electrify right. and unify the right. masses. So uh, another thing about that... Many, so, right, so is that the reason why so many agents are in the black organizations? What's your thoughts on that? Right, yeah. Another thing about that is that the government feared the civil rights organizations just as much as they feared the Black Panther Party because you have to understand one thing, and Malcolm said it best. They don't care if you're a Muslim. They don't care if you're a Baptist, a Mason, a Episcopalian, as long as you're black and they can't attend your organizations or they can't run your organizations, they have a problem with that, you know? So Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I believe that there are so many agents, you have to go back in the history, slavery time. Uh, Harriet Tubman wanted to come back and free her husband. Don't you know her husband said, I ain't going nowhere. I like my master. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sometime when Harriet Tubman would be taking the brothers to the freedom, sometime they would wanted to go back, she had to pull out her gun and say, That's you ain't right. going nowhere. Wow. That's right. Wow. So that, we call them agents now, but back then they had another name for them, you know what I'm saying? And uh, money, it was money. Sometimes, brother, and I'm not joking, sometimes, they would sell out people out for a slab of bacon. Yeah. Man, that's that. Negroes still, still selling us out. When they moved the vendors over on 25th Street, Virginia Fields, David Dinkins, uh, Percy Sutton, uh, Rango, uh, Bill Perkins, Denny Farrow, well, all these people really selling us out. Like all the building members are best. Oh, you know, yeah. Cause, uh, yeah, because like what you just said is all of them, a uh, majority of them are Boulay members, Brother Big Man. And we know what, what, uh, what Brother Steve Cookley said about that. Um, everybody who knows um, Brother Steve, I'm throwing them elbows right now. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, it's time to bow that. So, uh, um, Brother Big Man, what you think about the Boulay and, um, and, and, um, and then, you know, reconnecting that to Brother Steve Cookley and him revealing this so-called secret society of black men, you know, slash, you know, um, and their puppet women, you know, um, who act as the buffer between the grassroots movement and the so-called elite. And they themselves are called the Boulay or the Senior Profile, which means the advisors to the kings. Right. Right. I was, uh, 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 if I may say something here, um, I, I was listening when you was, when uh, you, big man, was, uh, Ask a question and brother uh, Dr. Aileen about uh, you saying that you uh, advising or ask Dr. Phil Valentine to investigate uh, the murder or the investigation of Steve Coakley, but you said you seem like you have you and the brother Dr. Aileen have to do the uh, work yourself. What exactly yeah, what did happened you mean was that? Yeah, what happened is that uh, brother Valentine the tape. The DVD that I made is over two hours long, and Brother Valentine never got a copy. Huh. So I never heard anybody give a lecture or discussion on the death of Steve Coakley. So that's why I said, look like me and Brother Arlene Bay is going to have to do that. 
Okay. That's why I said that. Okay. If uh, Brother Phil Valentine does get that tape, maybe he, we, he, all three of us can get involved and put our information together. Okay. And that's right. And that's right. And also in the chat room, they made a statement that just like you said, some of them sold, some of them sold out based on a slab of bacon. Well, right. You know, right. He, um, based on the um. Nation of Guys on the Earth, so the five percent teachers. It says that um, they like the devil because they give them nothing. <laughs> right. You okay. Know? Uh, another thing, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of our people, some of them might just not like you. Might what? not like what you look like. Might mm-hmm. not. Yeah, you know, I mean. Uh, now I saw Malcolm X in the flesh. Right. He had reddish skin, he right. had red hair, yeah. and he right. had greenish eyes. Right. So, I got to tell the truth. When I saw the debate where Brother Polite right. said that Fetty was light skin, right. I said to myself, I wonder what he would think about Malcolm X now. Right. right. So that's what I mean, that some people hate you just because of the way you look. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> some of the worst niggas in the world are black as coal. Right. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> so you don't have to be light or, or if you light, that don't make that you're not a, a real person. Right. You, like I said, you can be black as coal and be one of the worst niggas that ever walked the earth. And that right. could be vice versa, too. Because when you look at Africa, all that killing, mm-hmm. chopping off a baby's arms and legs and head, the, the Tutsis and that other tribe, I mean, all this division, I mean... Uh, right, and the, um, right, 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 yeah. Right. It's like the... It, it, it's almost like the devil don't even have to be there. We just on remote control killing each other, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's the miseducation of a Negro. We have had Carter G. Wilson, brother, big man. That's exactly that's what you said. Mm-hmm. That's true. Cool. And, and, and another thing, uh, I did research on, uh, when I lived in Harlem, I used to go to Schomburg Library, Library all the time. And when I moved down here, I got a book on Arthur Schomburg. That was one of Dr. Clark's teachers. And I read that he was friends with Marcus Garvey. Matter of fact, I got a picture of Arthur Schomburg standing right next to Marcus Garvey at a funeral. That's right. That's right. And then I read where Arthur Schomburg was a healthy man, you know, went to the dentist to uh-huh. get a tooth either pulled or looked at, and he went to the dentist and Maybe in a couple of days he was dead. Mm. Now, I'm 66. I'm just finding that out. Right. I'm just finding that out. So, and I'm a person that reads and studies and stuff like that. So there's so many mysterious deaths out here, brother, that when somebody tell you, man, you crazy, man. It it ain't no conspiracy. Yeah, I have brother. When Bobby Hammond first came to New York, he was talking about the homeless, that you, know, you don't see as many homeless now because they're right. driving the homeless up, and they're yeah. doing experimentations on the homeless. Right. You know, you if, you are, if you're a so-called militant, you know, you might, oh, man, you crazy, man, you know. But I got an article here, February 28th, 2011. Humans used in experiments. Biotechnics pa- panel will investigate past research, and the number one uh, experiment they were working on was the Tuskegee, 1966, huh. <clears throat> given uh, sisters to the brothers in the penitentiary. That's why I tell all the brothers and sisters, 
and young folks, stay out of these jails. Stay out of Because when you're in there, you can't eat what you want. You eat what they give you. That's right. And the medicine, whatever, if you got a headache, you think they're giving you bare aspirin? You got to drink water? Stay out of them jails. Mm. They gave the warehouses. They gave uh, smallpox blankets to the Native Americans, brothers and sisters. Right. That's right. We forget. Right. That's when you got to be wary of these the gifts. Uh, genocide. Mm-hmm. UNICEF sending food here and food there, and you wonder why now you got these colds that you can't get rid of, and virus and flu and all this stuff that's going down. They're giving it to you. No doubt. But, but man, let's, let's get into Dr. Khalis Muhammad's death uh, because, um, you know, we want to yes, link all of this together because we know that he's definitely one of the um, in, um, people who come in the image, you know, of right. Malcolm, uh, Malik El, um, El Shabazz. Right. And the, one of the things is, is that, matter of fact, his birthday was just, you know, a month ago, you know, January the 12th was um, Dr. Khalis' um, born day. You know, right. and uh, we definitely want to add him into the mix. You know, what's your thoughts on um, his assassination? Because we, um, we want to get into also what Brother Steve Copley said about it, too. When I heard about it, it hit me hard because right. Kylie was in Harlem all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I had my stand on 125th Street, my book stand, Collard, this is when he had his Rolls Royce. Collard would stop his Rolls Royce in the middle of 125th Street and jump out and come to my book stand and hold up Tata for 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> and we would talk. Then he would jump back in. Collard Muhammad was one of the boldest men, period, that I ever. Let me, let me tell you a story first. Uh, on 125th Street, you had Mashaw's Bookstore, and that's where all the nationalists would speak and Dr. Ben would speak and Malcolm would speak. And one of the first times I heard Malcolm, he was talking about how this plane crashed in Texas, and it had all these white folks on it from Texas. And somebody, uh, somebody uh, handed him a note. And Malcolm said, I got, I got a message from God. 125 devils just went down on an airplane. All praises due to Allah. Wow. That's what Malcolm said. And when I heard that, I said, wow, woo. Then fast forward to, I think it was 1990, when I first heard Khalid Muhammad. And when I first heard Khalid Muhammad, I'm going to tell you what I said, just like I said. I said, damn. When I heard Khalid, I said, damn, man, who's that? Because I had never heard him before. And he was talking about the white woman. And like I said, Malcolm was bad. But Khalid's language was from the street. And... From there, I would go to different lectures where college would be, sometimes City College, Slave Fed in Brooklyn, and then they moved to the Dempsey Center in Harlem, New York. And that was right around the corner where I lived, so you know I was there. And Alton Maddox said himself that it was two people that would fill up the Dempsey Theater. One was Steve Coakley, and the other one was Khalid Muhammad, when they came into town, the Dempsey held, I think, 500 people, and people would be standing up, and Khalid wow. would just blast them, you know? Wow. And uh, when I heard Khalid was dead, and then I heard somebody say something about an aneurysm, I said, there ain't no damn aneurysm. And then I began to hear what they said happened. Hmm. Uh him going to a Chinese restaurant, him coming home, 
making love to his wife's ambush, huh. him getting sick, Leaning for her, hours. her putting a pillow down, him going to the bathroom, urinating on himself, defecating what? on himself. Now, if you ever saw Khaled Muhammad, Khaled Muhammad was one of the cleanest black men. No, one of the cleanest men I ever seen in my life. <laughs> so for him to urinate on himself and defecate, his system was and breaking that, down. But he was so mother. strong mm. that he lasted. He lasted and ambushed his wife, put a pillow under his head, and she got back into the bed. And when a call was made, whoever got there, I think it was Hashem. And then Malik, they start clean. Well, ambush had cleaned up the, with bleach. Right. One of my favorite programs on TV is CSI. And they say, don't touch the evidence. She starts okay. splashing bleach everywhere. <laughs> right. When they got there, they where the defecation and everything, Malik said he cut that out the rug, but the damn rug disappeared. Exactly. That's what Steve said. The blood disappeared. The person who had the blood, they lost the blood. Yep. We had a lecture at Four Brothers Boutique, and Malik Zulu Shabazz did show for that lecture. It was on... The death of Khalid Muhammad, no holes barred. It was called Malik Zulu Shabazz in the hot seat. Right. The and death uh, of Khalid Muhammad. <clears throat> I, br- I brought a brother in who was uh, a scientist on plants and stuff like that. And he knew about poisons and he knew about blood. And his question to Malik was this uh, Brother Malik. Uh, the autopsy showed that they say there was no poison in Brother Khalid Muhammad's blood. He said, that's correct. Then the brother said, you remember when Brother Khalid got shot out in California and they took him to the hospital? Wouldn't you think that they would have taken blood from him there? Uh, Yeah, I would say, yeah. Malik said, where are you going with this, brother? He said, where I'm going is that couldn't they have switched the blood from California, which was so-called good blood, and switched it here, and that's why we don't see any poison in the blood. Malik said, brother, are you out of your mind? This ain't no twilight zone and all this kind of stuff, all this spooky talk. But brother... That's not spooky. The devil has fossils and bones from thousands and thousands of years ago. He had diseases and typhoids and plagues that he has under uh, uh, frozen, frozen temperatures preserving all these things. What's so spooky, brother? And he talked to the brother so bad that the brother sat down and didn't say anything else. Mm. 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 So, I I, I, I truly believe that Khalid Muhammad was murdered through poison. Right. Somebody that he know poisoned him. No doubt about it. I don't know who. Right. But it just fits all the other mysterious deaths. Don't right. forget that 9-11 came right behind Collins' death. If Collins would have been around, Collins was in Harlem all the time. If Collins would have been around, that would have been a, a war cry. Right. Well, let, let's Somebody didn't this. want him around. Right. Let's get into this, too, because Dr. Collins was working with Dr. Malachi York working with Wesley Snipes and working with um, right, Steve, right, right. With, um, um, Stevie Wonder. And it earned about 400 acres of peace 
down in near Edenton, Georgia, and it was getting ready to form their own town slash city. Now, right. Dr. Holland is killed. Malachi Zero goes to jail. What's he say? Goes to jail. Stevie Wonder um, is off the map for over 10 years. All right, so we know that there definitely was a conspiracy in order to stop that from happening, you know, from filming our own town. Um, you know, and that would mean having our own distribution, import and export, and that was another so-called Black Wall Street would have came into existence right there in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know that that had to be part of that scenario also, you know, because Wesley um, Snipes was going to provide the security team he had a security uh-huh. force that he was going to work with. You know, Dr. Collick, uh, you know, would have offered his expertise in that, in that he was um, a former Supreme Captain of the FOI, you know. Right. As well and as another also, thing, mm-hmm. yeah, another thing is that Wesley Snipes had the finances to finance that stuff. See, uh, right. having knowledge is one thing, but when you've got knowledge and money, you're really right. dangerous then. Exactly. Go, exactly. go on, brother. Right, so I know the first time I met Dr. Collett was in 1993. This was right prior to him getting shot by James Edward Best when he got shot in his leg and hit almost a million arms right. and he actually could have bled to death. But we know that that within itself was a conspiracy because they always come with that long gunman thing and the police actually opened up the car door so he can get into um, his truck, you know, in order to get the weapons. You That's know, true. And so, um, in which he ended up shooting Dr. Collett with, you know. Um, so we know um, that this was definitely conspiracy. Um, Steve Copeland does a whole thing on the first attempted assassination of Dr. Collett back in 90, it was around 90, on the end of 93 going into 94. Now, I met Dr. Collett, matter of fact, um, at that lecture, it was in Greensboro, North Carolina, he came out front in order to greet everyone, to say peace to them, to, to shake their hand and thank them for coming. I right. actually shook his hand and talked to him for a few minutes because one of his securities was one of my, my brother, Salah Muhammad, who actually was his bodyguard or security for Minister Farrakhan and for Dr. Khaled. Oh, okay. Okay? So, um, when I moved down to Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Khaled, was living down there in Atlanta, Georgia also, going back and forth between New York and the course of Atlanta, Georgia at that time. I sat next to him at a Steve Copley lecture when Steve was breaking down um, Dr. Khaled being excommunicated from the nation of Islam, and this was around 96, 97. And it was right before he joined the Black Panthers, the new Black Panthers, and he wanted to know what was our perspective on if he should even join or not. He right. wanted to hear from us if we should even if he should even join them or not. Mm-hmm. You know, because but he was so hurt about you know being excommunicated that he actually <laughs> cried like a damn baby next to me. Uh, right. So um, about being excommunicated, he was so dead. I mean, just here it is. You know that happened. You know, um, you know in ninety five. You know ninety four, ninety five. You know. Um, 95 was when he got, um, I can tell you, out from out of the um, Russian Islam. But here it was, two years later, he was still massively hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, crying, like, you know, like almost like a baby. She was just right, crying, right. you know, <laughs> everywhere. As he, he was for about, real. Right, as he spoke about him and his, how much hurt, you know, and how Minister Farrakhan could meet with these boule ass Negroes, these right. shuffling and jiving ass Negroes. You know, such as Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and um, um, Benjamin Chavis, you know, and right. actually put Benjamin Chavis in the Nation of Islam as Benjamin Muhammad and actually put him over mosque number seven, which was actually his former mosque. Right. You know, so all of this was taking place, and so the man was hurt. You know, I met Dr. Khaled, I was with Dr. Khaled again, you know, at another on um, um, Steve Copeland lecture, it was on, on Clark Atlanta University. And I went past him, I didn't even recognize him. And he eyeballed me so damn hard, I had to turn around and say, who the hell is eyeballing me this hard? And it was Dr. Mm. Collin eyeballing me that damn hard. <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, I said, I'm a Lincoln brother, I didn't even realize it was you. <laughs> huh. And that's how I had to get him to a little real 
you know, and um, and the eyeball stare from off of me. So the brother was yeah. powerful. He made me turn around, you know, and eyeball me so damn hard, you know, <laughs> that I felt the energy pierced in the back of my head that I had to turn around and see who this was. And it was Dr. Mm-hmm. Powerful. So he was powerful, you know. And so when I first yeah. heard it, I knew it was some damn underhanded shit. And, of course, I heard Malik say, that, well, you know, they was going to McDonald's and Burger King and right. Bell, Wendy's and all types of shit, you know, um, that day, you know, and went to a game, I think it was a, what, a basketball game or something. I can't remember what type of game right. it was. Right. But they, but they yeah. went to this and went to that, and, you know, that, yeah. you know we would stop to eat, eat this and eat that, and Dr. Carter had high blood pressure, yeah. and, we, and, you know, we tried to tell him not to eat and, you know, not to uh-huh. eat it and blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. So, you know, uh, what was your thoughts on that, brother? Mm-hmm. When you heard this same thing, what's that again? What was your thoughts on that when you heard that same explanation or same information coming from um, brother Malik, um, Malik Zulu Shabazz? Like that? I How said, I tell you the Malik truth. Mm-hmm. If it, if if even if it wasn't from Malik, when I heard what they say happened, that's why automatically my mind went to CSI because. Right. The facts, the facts were the, the facts are messed up, man. You don't, mm. you know, uh, all kind of crazy stuff. Mm. It was like the Keystone Cops. Mm. Now they garden call it Muhammad's body when he's dead, when they should have been guarding him when he was alive. That's right. You know, and uh, not to be funny, but. When I heard Carla's wife's last name, Ambush. Ambush, yeah. You all like, that. Say, for hmm. instance, Ambush. you meet somebody. You meet a, you meet a, uh, I say, I meet a sister. And I said, uh, my name is Brother Big Man. You know? Right. I said, what's your name, sister? My name <laughs> is Malika Ambush. Right. Automatically, <laughs> automatically, ambush. What what kind of name is that? So, exactly. N- names are powerful. Am I right or wrong, brother? So yes, oh, you no doubt. And even working for the Jews is even more powerful than the big name. Right. Because we thought that. And when you like, look oh. in the dictionary, and mm-hmm. look, look up the word ambush. So oh, yeah. I mean that, that's heavy, brother. So it is. This sister had something that Khaled really, uh, I'm looking for choice words, the personality, she was, she was a good-looking woman, and Khaled was a, a single man, and Khaled was a man. He likes he liked sisters. So when he met this sister, he had to like her very much because he got married in Egypt. I, I think if it, this is true, Bala Shango married Khaled and Ambush. Right. That would have been one of the biggest weddings in Harlem or New York. So I don't know why they had it in Egypt and how, why it was so mysterious. You know, nobody didn't right. know nothing until, boom. It came back, right. So, uh, oh, this is a good point. And I'm not lying on the brother. But Hashem <laughs> is the one that introduced Ambush to Khaled Muhammad. Back to Khaled. That's right. Huh. right. See, if you don't know these things, if you don't know these things, huh. why, why are you talking about that brother like that? No, this is the truth. And like they say, the truth shall set you free. Right. No doubt. Now, we also want to add into that, too, Brother Big Man, is the fact that when we get back to um, Ishmael Shango, Reverend Ishmael Shango, as well as also Dr. Khaled, like I said, uh, what was phenomenal was that my teacher, um, Prince Ramsey David Bay, who was actually the crown prince of the Empire Watch Store, D. Dr. Demonia, under the Empress, who was given that title um, June 7th, 1999, right before the raid on the property of the Empress in 2000. Now, what was interesting is that him and Dr. Khaled was actually members of the Nation of Islam at the same time, and him and Dr. Khaled knew each other. And actually, he was at the bad side the day when Dr. Khaled, when they put the plug on Dr. Khaled. Mm. Now, the interesting part is the fact is that he died on Dr. Khaled's born day, January the right. 12th. 
2004. Huh. So that's no coincidence. He was dead the day when Dr. Collins passed, and he passed on the day Dr. Collins born day. Ain't that something? Wow. So that shows the wow. connection, or I mean, it shows conspiracy, like you say. Right. Because I know my teacher, he just came back from Charlotte, you know, um, a matter of days prior to that. And I was in New York, um, you know, um, doing my first, you know, DVD, really, up there in New York. You know, I was, it was like that power up there, you know, that you know that weekend. And um, I was up there in New York, you know, January the 10th and 11th, you know, that weekend, mm-hmm. um, doing the... Um, you know, doing um with Shabazz, brother Shabazz. Right. You know, doing my um my first, you know, um lecture called the Sherman Healers. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as I get back within less than half an hour, you know, um Chris Bay calls me and my wife, you know, I'm out the kitchen, he said, I mean and I run out the um kitchen and he said, I think I'm having a heart attack. Call nine one one. So huh? so we call nine one one and they take so long to get there, Brother Big Man, and then when they come, they walk in. So I'm out there saying, God damn it, who you want to fucking ask this? Who you got damn ass right now, God damn it? And I'm, I'm yelling like a damn, um, like a sailor or like a damn, I'm right. talking like a damn um, sergeant in the right. military, you know, um, at them. And they probably run and run and run, and they um, get them, you know what I'm saying, and then they play like they trying to save them, you know what I'm saying, you know, because um, they had the, am, you know, the um, ambulance put up, like not too far in front of the store. And so here they are working on them, and we looking at them, you know, but they're only working on them when we look at them. Mm. You know, so, you know, it, it was a whole lot of um, strange things going on that Damn. time. And like I said, Ishimushi Bereshevo dies two days after Prince Ramesses, they were great brother. They right. were the 14th. You know, so um, that is no coincidence. You know, there's a lot of things going on. Like I said, Jacob Carruthers died a week and a half before both of them brothers passed on January. Mm-hmm. You know? So, um, a lot of strange things, brother. And like you said, uh, we, we definitely have to, um, that's what we do on these shows, to make sure that people understand and understand, you know, what's going on. You know, yeah. um, in the community, you know, with people who actually knew these people. You know, who shook the hand. Let, let's talk about um, how you first met Brother Steve Copley. And um, right. I'll speak about my experience with him also, brother, before we get off of here. Well, uh, at that time, we didn't even sell videotapes, and it wasn't no DVDs. We used to sell audio tapes. And on 125th Street, I had a large book stand, and I used to sell audio tapes. I don't even know where I got this audio tape of Steve Coakley from, but somebody gave me the tape. I had never heard of the man before, Steve Coakley. So I put the tape in, and I started listening, and he started breaking down this organization called the Play, the Gatekeepers, uh, Advisors to the King, and Secret Societies, and I got another tape. So I was playing the tape on my boom box, and people would come and say, who's that? I said, Steve Coakley. And we were selling the audio for five hours, I would sell them. And after a while, this guy, Steve Coakley, started attracting attention in Harlem because people would ride up and jump out their cars. So you got in that Steve Coakley? And I was selling the tape. And after a while, I had saturated the conscious community with Steve Coakley tapes. And then I heard that Steve Coakley was coming down. He was coming to the Slave Theater in uh, Brooklyn. So I had a, a small tape recorder that I would tape lectures. So I gathered up my tape recorder and went to Brooklyn. Got by, I got in, I went up to the front and got by one of them big speakers where I can get a good sound, and sure enough, there goes Steve Coakley, Alton Maddox that brought Steve Coakley to Brooklyn. And about an hour into his speech, he said something that froze me. He said, I want Brother Big Man. Now, we had never met. But the word had gotten back that I was selling this tape. 
Because when you buy a tape, they say, where do you get it? I got it from Brother Big Man. So he said, I want Brother Big Man. There's over 500 people in the slave theater that night. I want Brother Big Man to give Steve Coakley his cut of the tapes that he's been selling. And everybody looked at me. And he went on and on. And I said, I ain't, I said to myself, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to take it. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to take it. That's right. And the only thing I said, I said, Brother Steve, when the lecture's over, I'd like to meet you in the back. So then he got off of me and went on to the subject. And after the lecture, I waited till he finished. And he came up. Tall, tall brother. I shook his hand, and we hugged. Steve Coakley was rough, but he was also gentle. He sure was. I shook his hand, and I said, Brother, the information, brother, that you have is so important that I had to make tapes and copies and let the people hear what you had to say because they they never heard of this before. He said, Yeah, brother, I understand that. And I reached in my pocket. I think I gave him $50. And then he said, brother, from now on, if you want tapes, here's my number. And as time goes on, you can get the tapes wholesale from me, and you'll be one of my official sellers of Steve Coakley tapes. And every time Steve came into town, I had a little envelope for Brother Steve Coakley. And from there, we went from being business partners to really brothers. And that's why. That's why. That's right. I want somebody to speak on that brother because that brother laid down some information and he was sincere. You know, he was sincere. And, uh, Dying no like that, I, I forgot who even told me that Steve Coakley was dead. Because I was still calling his number. And his voice right. was on his answer machine, so I just figured he, you know, he was busy. But uh, when he came to New York, we, me and the brothers would follow him. And we even went to D.C. one time to hook up when he was doing lectures there. Even the brothers that had the good life and all these brothers who he did lectures, I didn't even hear them say nothing about Steve Coakley. Right. We did you know, it on the so radio I, show, but Big Man. Matter of fact, we dedicated a show to him. As a matter of fact, we dedicated several shows to him over the last year. Um, okay. You know, because, I like to get I like um, to get it. If you got a copy, I like to get a copy of those. You know, like, because uh, uh, I was mad. I tell you the truth, like, even in New York, as much as I love Brother Alton, they tell me, I don't even know if he mentioned it or they mentioned it. Or, it was just hard. Not too many things can break my heart. But when you mess with somebody that I care about, then that's that's a different story. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, yeah, sir. Right. Um, let me see. You can be out on the streets, brother, for so long and get like concrete, you know? Room. Right. Everyone in the chat room, please call in. The, area, the number is 626-414-3535. Um, for those who are in the chat room, once again, call in, 626-414-3535. If you want to continue listening to this, because we're going to 11 tonight, so we're going for another um, hour or so. Um, you know, so um, um, please, for those who want to continue listening, please um, call in. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to say this, too, about um, Brother Steve Copley. That I first met him in '95 at um, um, at um, Clark University down in Atlanta, Georgia, um, at the AU, um, and here I was listening to him speak and break his information down for the first time personally. Now I think I've seen a videotape in '94 of Brother Steve, you know, maybe '93, '94. I actually seen a videotape of him, but I did not get a chance to meet him until '95. Mm-hmm. Actually. And um, he dropped it, I mean, just dropped it in. You know, I had to walk up to him at the end and just shake his hand and just tell him how impressed I was with the information because at the time we were studying hard the Illuminati information and we were studying 
um, who was the members of the CFR, the council, which council for right. 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 the right. Right. Yeah. right. You, but we were studying all this information, and Steve come in and he just put all the pieces, all the you know the pieces together, and all the dots, you know, together, you know, for us. You know, we were like, you know, in all was like, yo, that's what I'm talking about. That's researching, you know, and. You know, and that's, you know, and, and I knew Steve and called him a few times. Matter of fact, in 2004, I actually was with Steve. My wife and I was with Steve um, basically all day long. It was back in March, in May of 2004, mm-hmm. right after my teacher passed. And me and Brother Steve was telling we was um, in Los Angeles um, area, and uh, we was uh, we went to um, the, um, the Black Museum there. And um, we was looking um, around, and he, you know, he was, um, check, you know, taking me through, you know, the areas in which I was conscious, you know, my wife and I, and we talked all day long, you know, from that afternoon over until, I mean, like two o'clock in the morning. Right. He broke, uh, you know, just broke down information to me, things in which that, you know, um, you know, he never wanted to say, you know, publicly, you know, I know about because he told me. Right. You know, as far as like some of the connections with the um, Illuminati, like who was funding certain organizations in the community and how they was being funded by the Illuminati, right? You no, know, by particular um, groups, you know. I mean, groups in which that we think is so militant, or so much have our back, right? You know, come yeah. to find out that they're being funded, you know. Right. So Steve was breaking that information down, as well as also, you know, um, a week and a half before he passed, I talked to him on the phone. I was um. Um, I sent him some money, and, you know, right. because um, at the time, Steve was going, going through some hard times because he just got out mm-hmm. of the hospital. And which he spoke about the fact how he don't even know how he got in the hospital. Right. He spoke about the fact, too, that the big man um, on that tape of him being with in a hotel room, you know, and next thing he know, he pitched out black, and he was in right. the hospital. I don't even know what happened. And he's in a coma, and next thing you know, he wakes up with, um, you know, um, Staples, all the way down the middle of his um, chest and stomach. Thirty-seven staples. Thirty-seven staples. You know, um, and then you know, doing what they did. They don't even know what they did. You know, huh. so you know when I talked to him, which was several times within that two-week span. I talked to him at least three or four times within that two-week span. Um, this, you know, see how he was doing because I was trying to get him to know to come on the radio show on this same radio show, and he was getting ready to give me, you know, a time and set up date and everything. And he talked right. about him being on the Nikki Love show and another um, broadcast um, that day. You know, uh, when I talked to him last, and so you know, he told me certain things and I asked, "Well, brother, how you feeling?" He said, "Well, you know, of course I'm not up to par, but you know, brother, they try to get me in there." I said, what you mean? He said, brother, I mean, they try to get me. They try to, you know, get me in my life. So, I mean, he told me this. He told me this. You know, so we're talking about actually actually doing an um, actual lecture, you know, on Brother Steve. I know from experience because I heard him say it. He told me personally what happened, you know, as much as he could remember, you know, as much as he could remember, which wasn't much. You know, but he was able to, you know, recall everything once he got out of the hospital, once he woke up and everything like that. You right. know, but, yeah. you know, the fact that he mentioned a woman, he never, he did not mention that part to me. So that would be interesting, you know, uh, for people to get that um, DVD from Brother Big Man or CD, excuse me, for Brother Big Man or go to the Nikki Love show, you know, the, um, that which is uh, one of the last speeches by right. um, Brother Steve Coakley and check that out where he speaks about some women came to the hotel room in which that next thing he knows, he's blacked out in a coma in the hospital, waking up. I think it was like what eight days later. Oh yeah. Uh, another know, thing, so, Brother Lane. This is why it's so important to have at least one person that you can trust. Because right. yes, sir. Uh, I have a network now where if a brother or sister don't hear from me in a couple of days, they right. know something is up. Right. Right. You've had brothers and sisters that died in their homes and decayed where you couldn't even identify the bodies because mm-hmm. no, there was no communication. You stopped seeing a brother, you you know, you might say, where's John at? But, you know, you don't go to knock on the door and try to find out what's up. 
Right. So I have told some brothers and sisters in New York to call in. Now's the time. I want you all to call in and ask some questions because a lot of times people give lectures, but they don't have a question and answer to it. Mm-hmm. But this is the time to ask some questions. And right. the more que- you learn a lot more sometimes by the questions than the lecture because uh, I can go back. I can go back in my mind. I remember. So I, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, All right. We're going to call. Um, we're going to bring in every call 561. Every call 561, you're on the line. You, you have a question to comment? Come on in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is um, Brother um, CPM Hotel from uh, West Palm. Oh, Hotel. Brother Hotel. Hotel brother. All right, now. Yeah, um, I just had a question. Uh, the brother was just saying we have a question. It's a clown. So I do have a question. Okay, um, Malcolm X. Now, knowing that the Quran was speaking about the, the different wives, this is what I heard. So, so why did he come in and start to um, investigate the the different wives that the Honorable Elijah had. Right. They they came through and he has uh, um, Elijah Muhammad's son, known as Wolf D. Muhammad, who actually put that bug in Malcolm's ear, in which that, um, at the time, it is said that he also was an FBI informant. Right. Right. So he actually put that in um, in his ear, in which that um, allegedly um, made Malcolm go forth. Because Malcolm did question the fact that, based on all the Quran, um, that um, you have to, you know, that you have up to four wives and multiple concubines, you know, all right hand possessions, as it was called within the, um, yeah. within the Quran. You know, yeah. so um, that would be easy to bypass if that fact would have been um, put out there. But the fact yeah. that Elijah Muhammad told them um, to be monogamous and not deal with that type of Islam in the sense of the Arabized Islam. Um, that made it tougher. Yeah. But, you know, the sad thing is this, is that I have a DVD, brother, where most of those sisters are with uh-huh. Farrakhan now. They are members of the Nation yeah. of Islam. The women that uh, Malcolm said were uh, uh, abused or taken, uh, not taken care of by Mr. Muhammad, <laughs> those women are with Farrakhan and their sons and daughters are with Farrakhan. That's the uh, ironic part of it is that uh, Sister Tiana, Mah- I think if I'm pronouncing them, Sister Tiana Muhammad. Her name was Evelyn. Her right. name was right. Evelyn. Right. And in right. the book, right. Autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, in other books, they say that Malcolm before he met yeah, Jenny, that. had liked mm-hmm. her. He did. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. like I said, I got to tell the truth. Here's, the, here's Mr. Muhammad. I think he might have been in his 60s then, having relationships with a woman that Malcolm had eyes for at one time. I've heard that. That might bring in a conflict, too, of... That right. uh, that older man. Oh. See, I gotta tell the truth. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I've heard that. What you're saying? Well, I know it was uh, a lot of a lot of people don't even know about that. No, I heard about that. Right. No, I heard about that, brother. So, so uh, uh, there's a lot of things, brother, that if you did a lecture in New York in particular, and you were talking like this. Negroes want to kill you <laughs> because they haven't gotten to the point where they can analyze and listen to the truth. They say they want it's like that movie. You don't want the truth. You can't take the truth. Yeah, and that's what it, that's what it's like, brother. Yeah, You're so we're so used to listen to other stuff. That's why I tell everybody read everything. They 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 telling people not to go sing see Django, go see Django, 
because there's some stuff in Django that's heavy, right. especially that part where uh, this white guy tells his other slave master uh, about Alexander Dumas. This cracker had a library and didn't even know that one of the books he had was written by a black man who not only wrote The Three Musketeers, but wrote The Man with the Iron Mask and exactly. The Count of Monte Cristo. Exactly. Yes, sir. I had read those books when I was 13 years old. So when people tell me, I wouldn't read that, I would, brother, sometimes I'll buy a book for one page. Yeah, if that too. page can prove the truth, I'll get it or buy it, Xerox it, and take it back to the store. And when I was in New York, I used to liberate books. Since they had taken everything from us, I used to get my reparations on the spot. So, uh, so, uh, brother, it's a lot of things. It's just like people don't want to talk about uh, a couple of Malcolm's uh, daughters being involved with Caucasians. They don't want to talk about that. Uh-huh. Because they can't take the truth. They want the sweet stuff under the rug. Right. They, it's all right to talk about Mr. Muhammad, but it's not all right to talk about some of Malcolm's daughters going with white men. You can't talk about that. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm talking about. You should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sir, and, brother, my, I, and, like, and like my wife said, um, one of the reasons is because they seen black men kill their father right in front of them. Oh yeah, right. So, um, so of course that that was a form of self hatred within itself. You know, um, that's true. You know, that's about, true. It's about, about the mistrust of the so called black man. You mm-hmm. know, what I'm saying to the black woman yeah. who had to see something like that so horrific. You know, I'm um, done to them. They were psychological. They were psychologically scarred. Even the ones in the room, you know, Malika and Malika. You know, what I'm saying they was they are psych- you know they are um, psychologically scarred. You know, oh all yeah, they are. Uh, you know, when when you go through that trauma of being matter of fact, Betty was pregnant, so all that fear, all that trauma went inside those babies. And exactly. I'm not saying anything against Brother Malcolm's family. Just to be right. painted, you know right. what I'm saying? But I understand. Right. I understand it really. Right. Oh, I, I'll, but, look, uh, I, just, I just, just, I just, I just believe if, if you could talk about someone, that someone could talk about you. That's right. what I. You know, I remember how Malcolm used to call Dr. King a boy, right. Uncle Tom, he, the Big Six, and stuff like that. Yeah. So right. when someone would say something about. Uh, Malcolm, I would want to fight when right. I was young. You know, hey, on the corner, on the Twenty Fifth Street. But here's yeah. Malcolm talking about somebody else. So when you get yeah. when you get older and you're supposed to get wiser, if you could talk about my mama, I could talk about your mama. Right. Well, I mean, Malcolm woke me up. It wasn't even in the physical. I, I got woke up through his autobiography. Right. 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 So did I. Yeah. And, my, oh, my godmother's daughter kept telling me, um, you know, like, I remind her of Malcolm. And I'm like, who? She, she kept saying Malcolm X. I'm like, who the hell got the last name X? Who the hell got the last name X? Nobody got no last name X. <laughs> Is this a made-up person that you're talking about? <laughs> you know, and she's like, yo, you need to go to the library. So guess what? I went to the Schoenberg Library, and guess, just like you, Brother Big Man, I had to liberate myself, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, and one of them was the autobiography of Malcolm X, you know, along with the message to the black man and so forth and so on, in which I began studying at the age of 11, because, I mean, on 12, because at 11, um, um, a female started telling me about some other information. You know, it was about Malcolm, but I didn't know anything about who he was. You know, I was, you know at the time, um, about two years prior to that, I was in the third grade. And I was living in Coney Island at the time, and that was my first time even hearing about Malcolm. But they didn't really go into detail about who he was. So it went from, you know, went in one ear and out the other until my godmother's daughter told me about him, you know, later on, you know, at the age of 12. 
in which that, you know, sparked my interest because you kept telling me over and over again. Yeah. You know, you know, and so, and guess what? She was a heroin addict. But the mm. fact was mm. that she mm. turned me on, that saved my life. Right. You know, and the fact that I went, you know, I started studying the principles of what Malcolm stood for, was that no drugs, no smoking, no drinking, et cetera. You know, and that's what influenced me was actually through Malcolm, you know, through the autobiography. So the thing is, is that that book, even though as lacking as it is, as much oh, as yeah, many chapters was taken out, which was about three to four chapters, right. essentially that book has saved hundreds and thousands of brothers and sisters. That's true. With their that's position. true. Yeah. You know, that's why I mean, yeah, that's what mm-hmm. I mean, read everything. I, I had the original hardcover with the original hardcover was selling for like at that time back in the sixties for like right. seven dollars. Hardcover and it had pictures in it. Right. That's the original it had pictures in it. Right. And um I'll tell anybody, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. But just right. know how to break it down. When you read anything, break it down and uh, understand what you're reading. You can read, but if you don't understand what you're reading, you know, right. and that that brings me to uh, back to college's uh, son, right, Farrah Gray, because right. uh, well, actually was called um, Farrah yeah, Khan, yeah, right, Farrah Khan um, Muhammad, right, right. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I picked up his book. I talked about Fire Gray maybe 12 years ago. Right. And I think I'm the first person that showed him shaking hands with Bill Clinton in the he White was. House. Uh-huh. Right. And that was when Colin right. Muhammad was alive. Right. Now, that how he did that, I don't know. Quite but he's in the White House shaking hands with Bill Clinton. And uh, in the book called The Rillionaire, he mentions his father, but he doesn't mention him by name. He just says he's a good speaker. You know, uh, right. when Colin was murdered, Colin had a brownstone on Strivers Row. Right. That was worth over five hundred thousand dollars, right? And Father right. Gray got his cut out of that. He says in his book that he was a millionaire at a young age, by the age of fifteen, right? Right. Then why did people have to take up money for college uh, funeral? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why was the Black Panther exactly. Party asking for money? Right. For college, when you got a son who says he's a millionaire. Right. And this is the spooky part. Don't tell me the white newspapers and magazines and reporters don't know he's Khalid Muhammad's son. Yeah. Why well, they're they not exposing that, I don't know. Is that Maybe they were waiting for the right time. Well, that's waiting for the right time if he go out of hand, if he gets out of hand, brother big man. Okay. Right. You, you know how that is. Um, you know, boule attendance, you know what I'm saying, is that they have to get something on you, you know, um, just in case if you get out of hand, just like Martin got, of hand, got out of hand. You know, right. Martin started talking about the poor people campaign, started talking about, you know, uh, Vietnam and how the war should be stopped and how the Vietnamese never called us niggas. And so forth and so on, and he going more and saying these types of things, the same things in which that, um, you know, Muhammad Ali was saying, you know, and and so this thing, you know, became very big, and so it was against the war, it was anti-war, and so that was against um, the United States uh, foreign policy, right? And that also was one of the dilemmas in which that the United States had, in particular, um, of the fact that you know, Diego Hoover wanted to. You know, you know, get rid of Martin Luther King, you know, because he expired to be one of those um, black messiahs, as you know, they mentioned right. within that whole yeah. month before, in which I was co-intel pro. 
it's just like that film that they had on uh, King's wife and Malcolm's wife. Right. Betty and Coretta. There right. was some information in that that was good, too. Right. That's why I always say you got to watch everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that showed how um, Betty was telling Malcolm that when the house got bombed, she thought he was going to stay with the family because right. somebody had just tried to kill us. Malcolm said, I'm going to Detroit. i got to do a lecture. Right. And, and the reason why, he was he was so dedicated. Right. And he thought but, that the brothers would take made, care of his family while he was on this mission. That's why I know he wasn't playing. He was for real. Because right. the but average man, oh, if doubt. your house had just got bombed, and your family was in the house, you would have stayed there with your family. But he was so dedicated that he went to Detroit to give that lecture. Right. Now, 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 that goes back to what you were saying about Captain Raymond Sharif and also Elijah Muhammad Jr. Right. Being the ones who actually commend um, 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 those assailants to bomb Malcolm's home. Mm. Uh, it, was even, it was the nation Islam property or house, but Malcolm was staying there as one right. of the um, top ministers or being the top national spokesman for the nation of Islam at the time. Right, right, right. You know, so it was actually Raymond, um, Captain Raymond Sharif along with um, Elijah Muhammad Jr., in which mm-hmm. that is allegedly stated to have um, told those assailants to bomb that house. Mm. Now, Another thing. Because you, because you mentioned them earlier about Raymond Sharif. And you made mention right. of Elijah Muhammad Jr. earlier. So, what information that you have on that? And we're going to have to get ready to end after this last question because I got a half an hour. So I have to, um, 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 yeah. A few minutes or so, I have to bring the sister in in order to um, break down this other information. But go ahead, Brother Big Man. Yeah, I'm just going to say one thing is that the Audubon Ballroom was a place that anybody could rent. Mm-hmm. And they had a night with the FOI at the Audubon Ballroom, and that's when, uh, to my knowledge, uh, I think uh, Elijah Muhammad Jr. and uh, John Ali visited New York at that particular time. And when you rent a place, you can just walk all over and know where the exits are, where the bathroom is at, and how to get around, how to get in. And how to get out. That's so right. I truly believe that there were agents in the nation of Islam, whether they were working for the government or the government itself, because all you got to do is put a bow tie on a black man and have him say, Assalamu alaikum, and you think that's he's a Muslim. Right. And that, that's it. So it was, see, people could be working together and not knowing they're working together. True. Mm-hmm. That's what they call uh, free agents. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so, sir. Uh, it's a puzzle, brother, because the reason why it's a puzzle, a lot of the people that know what really happened are dead. Right. And the ones that are here now are scared to talk about it. Uh, Captain Joseph was in the process of writing a book. He gets a heart attack all of a sudden. Right. Wow. When you begin to start writing these books, brother, these books, you know, William Cooper, Manly Marble. Mm -hmm. Manly Marble didn't even see his damn book get on the stands. He was dead. (laughs) He sure did. Right. He did. So, it's heavy, brother, and it's going to get heavier because as long as there's a bloodline of Malcolm X, his grandson, somebody need to get him, a wise man need to get him on the side and let him really study his grandfather, how his grandfather would ask, answer questions and answer questions because when you read this report, it was saying that uh, 
while speaking out about the murder of Trivon Martin Shabazz said there are hundreds of black Americans who are murdered in the United States every year with impunity, and police officers serve no time. Yes, they sir. always get off. Yes, sir. Shabazz said that minorities will always be at the bottom and added, we should take down the system. This is what they said he said. We should take down the system completely and set up a new system of our own. That's revolution. And the way they got the Patriot Act now, they can take your words and use your words against you. Just right. like I said, even though Minister Malcolm X was telling the truth about Kennedy and the chickens would come home to roost, that what his enemies used to bring him down. So mm-hmm. I think young Malcolm needs a circle of elders because when you're young, you really don't care. You know, when I was like 20 years old, man, I, I didn't think bullets could stop me. You know what I'm saying? But right. I know now they can, you know what I'm saying? But uh, the picture I have of the young brother, just put some glasses on and he looks just like Malcolm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. So you were saying about people want to call in or what? Yeah, um, I have to go to the phone line because um, we have another guest on which that is coming on. And which that's going to be coming okay. on. Mm-hmm. Yes, don't is, you, uh, I, I'll leave you with this. If you want to stay on by the big man, you can. Um, I think we might have one caller here. Hold on. Every code 702, every code 702, you're on the line. Is that 702 you called out there? Greetings. Peace. Peace. Much love yes. to you. Much love to you. Yes, sir. Peace, boy. Brother Aleem, how you doing there? You doing well, brother. You know what? Uh, I love the topic tonight. It's Black History Month. I have a very (laughs) serious question to ask you about. Now, I'm in a whole other town right now. Now, Mm -hmm. in a professional environment, can you hear me clear? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. In a professional environment, let's just say you got a cool nigga that supervises. Now, if he comes out his mouth derogatory towards black folks, and the majority of the people in that environment is white, Mexican, and Asian, just a couple of black folks, but he's saying something derogatory about the black race. This is why black people do this. That's what's wrong with black people. Do, you, can, do I have... Round to file a lawsuit. Um, yes. Um, did you try pulling him to the side in order to talk to him about his coonery? The coonery that he has is so deeply embedded that he's because he's so embedded yeah. in the Christianity realm to where it, it's not going to even, it, it's no point. I got you. Yes, yeah, so you have to file a discrimination um, lawsuit against um, against the um, brother as well as the fact of the company itself, in which that um, um, have him hired because that is a form of discrimination. And you know, of course, um, if you heard it, you was eyewitness to it. Then, of course, you can detail it within an affidavit, which is known as a complaint, in which that you have filed first with the human resource department, and then you can actually um, take it to. Um, you know, into the civil side on the, at the federal level, um, starting with um, also another complaint filed there if you choose to. So um, it depends on the method in which that you want to use. Um, then you have to get into the civil rights violations, um, Title um, 42, um, also 1983, 1985, et cetera. So, you know, also dealing with, um, um, you, know, um, you know, dealing with that particular discrimination you know, from the brother. So that's definitely what you can do. Okay. Now, th- this is the flip side of it now. We we, we we are men amongst men, right? So we talk about different things, but I'm not the one that's employed. Mm-hmm. 
You know, it's a situation to where he's the only one that's employed by this company. You know, it's a right. learning process mm. that we're going through. He's the one that's employed. Wow. Right. Well, so he's the one that really has an influence on everybody that's listening to what he's saying. Now, men right. amongst men, we talk about women a certain way. You know, we do d- different things, but to come out of, amongst your own race and for there to be such a small amount of people that are your race amongst everybody else and you come out your mouth this way, you belittling who I am. Right. Well, you can definitely tell the individual, you know, if you're going to follow, like, like for example, you're going to follow the lawsuit, brother, um, you had to start with first with a complaint about what you um, um, heard and what you eyewitnessed. You know, and like I said, you have to follow with that company, um, human resource department, in order to put them on notice that this could possibly lead to a lawsuit um, based on the, um, on the individual's discrimination um, towards you and towards um, your people or whatever the case may be. So it actually deals with a form of self-hatred, you know, and you will have to detail the self-hatred factor also for them um, in the complaint, you know, whether it's going to be starting at the human resource department or whether it goes further to the federal um, government. But um, Oh, the chain of command, I have to go through the chain of command? Yeah, you have to definitely do that, brother, so that you can um have a paper trail. Okay. We'll follow, yeah, we'll follow the paper now, trail. Now, that know. right there might, might hinder my progress if I if I do it like that. Well, I mean, um, brother, I mean, that's the only thing you can do if that's how right. you feel about it. Otherwise, you will have to do like Brother Big Man say, you, you have to keep your mouth closed. You know yeah, about the situation. You know, so, so you think, I mean, you think if I go through the uh, chain of command and, and I try to keep my mouth closed, you don't think that it'll leak out a little bit and he might just disappear? Well, that's the point of putting the um, the complaint in and filing it with the human resource department so that they can um, send it to the um, appropriate authorities or the ones who are high up within the company so that they can read it and then make that determination. Otherwise, you just um, playing with fire. You know, because, right. Um, that is so embedded within the um, brother self hatred is, and um, um, it's going to come up over and over again. But um, thank you, brother. Um, we got to go because um, um, I got to bring the sister on. Just ask for copies, though, right? Yeah, ask for copies, copies, right? Okay, I appreciate it. Much love to both of y'all. Yes, sir. Peace and love, boy. Uh, yes, brother. I'm gonna cut out. Uh, I'll listen to the sister, but uh, right. I got to do a little homework too. Uh, down here for Black History uh, Month, ironically, at certain churches, I do Blacks in History. Uh, I have done Marcus Garvey. I've done uh, Frederick Douglass. I've done King. Uh, this uh, Saturday, I'm going to be doing uh, this the history of Harriet Tubman. So yeah. I'm going to... Uh, my research on Harry Tubman right now. Okay. Beautiful. Sounds good. Beautiful. Big man. And I'm going to get you those um, DVDs um, back to you um, as soon yes, as I sir. can. Right, right now we're in the process of um, doing some things, so we definitely want to get that to you. Yeah. In the words okay. of Malcolm X, if you're outside at someone's house listening to this conversation, go home in peace. If anybody put their hand on you, send them to the cemetery. Peace. 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 We want to thank Brother Big Man for definitely coming on, giving us um, his analysis, being that he actually knew these individuals, seen them in um, in full life, up close and personal. Yes, sir. He personally knew some of these individuals. Um, you had to bring them on in order to get right. a better um, analysis and a more well-rounded well, well-rounded well um, analysis and assessment of what actually was taking place in the 1960s and what was going on in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, mm-hmm. and then with the 2000s, um, you know, within these last four generations, well, four, um, excuse me, four decades, you know, and two generations um, of what, you know, actually took place. So we get ready to bring the sister on. Hopefully this is her. And we call 803, we call 803 on the line. Eight zero three on the line. Hopefully it works here. I don't care. All right, here we go. 
Blessings. Greetings. Blessings. Peace. 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 <laughs> Right. We there, we there. Okay, I heard y'all. We, 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 we finally here, exactly. This is the Rush Chef. For those who do not know, this is Sister Sasha Long. Bless um, it. And no doubt she works tonight in order to um, get it popping on what is getting ready to happen with that Melanin Longevity Conference, in which that we have coming up. And we're going to have several this year. And so we got to make sure that all of y'all attend. So uh, what do you got for us? Well... We're gearing up for it, and um, I'm feeling it's going to be very powerful. It's going to be very positive, and it's going to be a bunch of fun. <laughs> um, March the 29th through the 31st, coming up right around the corner, we will be having our first uh, series of the Melanin Centered Longevity Conference, three days and two nights. It's going to be in Catawba, South Carolina, and the focus is basically for us to start really understanding what it means to be holistically healthy. And the goal is to teach practical applications that people can apply into their daily lives that will transform and make a serious and concrete difference in their lives, in their in their whole wellness, because we crazy right now, and <laughs> we need to get fixed and bad. <laughs> That's so sad. Beautiful. Beautiful. Not a body. Yes. So, um, of course, yourself will be there with us. Um, we'll have a series of classes and workshops um, that will be facilitated by um, Dr. Aleem and his goddess, uh, the Princess Kadira, as well. Um, Coach Kair um, is going to be there. And I, I, I will let you, Dr. Aleem, speak about what you, you plan on bringing and what your contribution is because, uh, you know, only you do it the way you do. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to be dealing with the life force energy known as the Kundalini Shakti um, with the Kundalini Shiva, the seven chakras, nine chakras, 12 chakra systems in which that we are developing which is basically the endocrine gland system, how to regulate the hormonal balance within the body from these um, particular ductless glands, as well as also um, dealing with the science of Qigong, Tai Chi, um, mm-hmm. Reiki, plant healing. So we will be dealing with all energy modalities, um, even hydrosology, um, um, reflexology, acupressure, um, as well as also many other um, sciences, um, along with yourself, um, Brother Kair, Mm-hmm. Um, we know um, Sifu Kair, he's um, definitely a master um, at the science of the energy art, so he will also be taking people through um, the various art forms of the Qigongs and yes. Tai Chi, you know, mm-hmm. and many other things. Um, he's also one of the brothers in which that um, deal with the science of being able to make a woman orgasm with just um, um, strokes, you know, above the um, body of a woman. So without mm-hmm. even um, touching her, his non-touch, you know, um, um, is the science. So um, we will be there um, doing that portion of the um, sciences as well as also many other um, facets of the science of healing because it is dealing with the Melanin Centered Longevity Conference. So we will be doing everything, all the science of melanin, the history, um, the particular sciences as far as what to do with your melanin, how to cleanse your melanin, um, the particular herbs to take, the particular foods to eat, you know, That's these right. are the medicines, you know, the yes. foods are your medicines. So um, as well as also the particular water to drink, you know, um, and also yeah. various breath techniques in which that alters the state of consciousness, taking you from a beta to an alpha to a delta to a theta, delta theta state, um, what is known as the five states of consciousness, uh, which is dealing with life consciousness, um, subconsciousness, superconsciousness, magnetic consciousness, and infinite consciousness, along with the other two states of consciousness, which we refer to as interpersonal <laughs> and interpersonal consciousness. So we're going to be thinking we do everything we possibly can under the sun. There's nothing yeah. to do with it, but we do it all together for you. This conscious and that conscious because it's time to wake up. And I exactly. tell you, we, we, it's going to be fun. It's, it's, I'm so excited. Um, my elder mom, uh, her name is uh, Dr. Bertha Maxwell Roddy, and she's 
Uh, we're going to be at her space. Um, the Roddy family almost owns, which is a black family, owns the city of Catawba. They own the majority of the land there. And um, they have a beautiful um, bed and breakfast sitting on seven acres, and then they have the family reunion center that's like about a half a mile down the road, and that's where we'll actually be there. And it's, it's going to be all communal lodging as well as outdoor tenting. This is going to be like a holistic boot camp, so get ready. <laughs> and it's going to be all raw and vegan meals. Um is we also as well we want to make the 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 we want to make it family friendly and affordable so that there are no excuses because it's crucial right about now and yeah. I look at it like this anybody who is not serious about their health getting in their right mind having their emotions totally balanced out where they can actually have some self control anybody who ain't on that they in trouble <laughs> it's they like, are right. exactly. They got Exactly. Did you feel the change in the ties around December twenty first, twenty twelve? Did you feel any energy change? Oh any my God! Anything? Yes, yes, yes. Everything has been in a massive like acceleration. Every it's, it's like we're moving at warp speed. And honestly, ain't nobody got time for holding on to nothing that 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 is not of any value. Whatever it is that's, that's, that's weighing you down, bogging you down, um, um, keeping you down, pressing you down, it's time to just let it go because it, everything is moving at such an accelerated path, uh, uh, pace that it, it takes every ounce of our energy just to keep up. And this is why it's so important that we be balanced that we be balanced because the universe and the atmosphere is going through a shifting. We are feeling it seriously on the earth plane. And those who are who are not in a conscious state and those who are eating garbage every single day are the ones that are having the most grossest effects of what's going on out there. So those that are reaching for the light, that's, that's who we're there for because, you know, that other energy has just got to do what it got to do. So this is we, we, also this again is is three days and two nights. Um, it's a hundred and fifty dollars per person. To me, that is like phenomenally like that's like the serious conscious family community rate. <laughs> because again, we want folks. It's important that we we get together. Those of us who are like minded, who live in the light, who need support who need advocacy, who need discipline, who need understanding, who need under, who need community, this is our watering hole. So we need to, you know, do more than be armchair revolutionaries, you know, and I, and I, and I say that, you know, just very, like, unoffensively in any kind of way. But what I'm saying yeah. is this is the kind of retreat where you come to learn some serious inner, outer survival skills. Um, um, because it's just crucial like that right now. Also, we have um, Dr. Sakino Day, who is an indigenous tribal council. Um, he's also, you know, because we are the majority, many of us, I'm not going to say the majority, but many of us are Moors, um, and, and and he teaches uh, uh, he teaches our law. He gives us the understanding. He gives us the understanding of all the madness, the illusion of law versus the true law, and how to navigate your way out of that artificial thing. So he's he'll be there. He'll be he'll give uh, he'll do a lecture, and then uh, on the Sunday we'll have a panel discussion. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going it, to one of my goals is to keep this in such a way that it's, it's very interactive. It's very active. I think the the day of going to lectures where you just sit down and listen is coming quickly to an end. It's time to really get active, and 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 it's time to for us to start doing the things that we talk about, doing the exactly. things yeah. that we that we say we we that we teach others about. You know, it's time to start doing it. And I've been saying this to myself in my own circle for about three years now. I'm tired of sitting around talking about this stuff. I'm ready to just do it. Let's do it. Right. No doubt about it. And speaking about doing, what are you going to be doing? Because you don't get to use 
We got the everywhere. Right. Else, what are you going to be providing for this workshop lecture slash um, health slash medicine mm-hmm. for this longevity conference? Exactly, exactly. Well, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, the the chef. I, I pre- I'm going to be the one preparing our meals and all of that and, and sort of just really leading the team because there will definitely be tasks and uh, activities that everybody will participate in that help to sustain the, the retreat for the weekend. But I'll be preparing the, the raw vegan meals, and um, I'll be doing a session on how to eat to live, how to um, maximize uh, your your health with superfoods, uh, you know, teaching and reminding us really of the simple laws of health because it's so easy to be healthy and it's so crazy to just be sick, especially unnecessarily. It's one thing where you don't know. But once you know, all you have to do is apply what you know. Um, um, how to naturally detox and overcome health challenges through the proper use of food. And um, um, while we're there, even our the way that we will be eating, the cycles with which we'll be eating will be in alignment with what I have laid out as a natural daily discipline for health. So um, we will be juicing. Uh, uh, we will be getting sun. We will be taking nature walks. Um, we will have yoga in the morning. We will have Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, um, I'm just so excited. Y'all stop me. Interrupt me. Say something. Ask no. a question. No. <laughs> you don't want to interrupt, but, but, but we do want to add on. Now, now, now. So do this mean I'm going to have my um, my um, pizza and my brownies? Yes. <laughs> I know. I'll definitely have pizza and brownies on this time. <laughs> wait, wait. And for those who don't know, we're we're not talking about um um New York pizza. We're talking about Sasha Long's uncooked raw pizza. That's right. right. And raw brownies. Okay. Mm-hmm. You don't know what that is. When we say raw, we mean uncooked. In other words, yeah. um, I I don't know what she put together with it. But all I know is it's good. It's live. It's live. The only downside on that, every time I think about nuts, because, you know, the wall, the uh, the brownies are made from nuts, is that Coach Kair cannot do nuts. So I'm going to have to make something special for him because he is so special right, right. anyway. <laughs> right. Well, don't worry. We got some hydro peroxide for him. It's okay, food grade. Just in case anything okay. happens, he'll be all right. <laughs> Um, any closing remarks, Mr. Sasha Lane, what you got for us? You got about eight minutes. Well, I just feel like um, I feel so blessed and so thankful. I really, really do. And um, so many wonderful things are manifesting. And I'm praying that the same thing is going on in mostly everybody else's reality, even if it's, you know, even if we do look at a bunch of ugly stuff, you know, on the internet, yeah. mm-hmm. and on the news, and, you know, and all yeah. of that. Because the bottom line is that we are all here on a journey, and everybody is responsible for themselves to a certain degree. We are responsible and on different levels for each other. But our main work is to work on ourselves from the inside out. And the universe is answering a lot of our prayers. And I'm praying that we are really listening, that we are not so caught up in the propaganda that's being thrown at us on a daily that we don't really see what's really going on. And that's what this longevity conference is all about. It's about waking ourselves up on every level possible so that we can totally be aware holistically of what's going on around us so that we can more safely navigate through it. Because when I'm getting where I'm going, I'm praying you're getting there too. <laughs> All right? No doubt. That's All right. It. Yeah, well, well, we're traveling right along with you. Um, Brother L, Grand Sheik, do you have any closing remarks you want to say? We got about maybe... Um, actually, we got about we still got about maybe seven minutes left here. You got any closing remarks? Oh yes, sir. Uh, brother, I, I, I sure have enjoyed the uh, blog talk show tonight, and uh, hopefully we will have a uh, uh, big man, uh, big man here again pretty soon. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah no doubt. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad to see here. She talked yeah, about. Uh, what was that more? I was saying that. 
um, me and Brother Big Man, we're going to do a whole show, along with you, we're going to do a whole show on the Black Panther Party and how okay. they were that Right. Um, that probably going to be um, probably in about two weeks, two, three weeks. And also, Sister Sasha Long, the goddess, is going to be back with us. The Raw um, Weekend Chef is going to be with us once again every week, you know, all the way until April. You know, basically, Wonderful. you know, um, sharing her own points of views and getting that information out on the science of health. Matter of fact, we I'm the third co-host, um, so she can, um, you know, um, give out this health information to our people because it's so valuable and so much needed. Right, and how, about to that. and how to detoxify our mm-hmm. bodies and everything because they mm-hmm. definitely need that. That's yes. Right. And it definitely protect us from a lot of sickness and diseases that too many of our more uh, people have a day. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. You know, you know that, that, I know they help me a lot. You know, yeah. uh, it, it helps uh, get rid of a lot of these constipations and uh, diabetes, high blood pressures, That's uh, right. arthritis, and things that of that nature. And That's uh, right. it, 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 the, the holistic is very, like you said, in these times and days, 2013. The age of Aquarius. This mm-hmm. is the age of truth. So, That's you know, right. everybody got to get ready, get online, you know, or else be left behind. That's, that's right. right. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's my vote on that. That's right. And for those who haven't got a chance in order to check us out, um, you can go online to our new website. It's www.drlamelbay. Um, that's D R A L I M E L. B E Y, that's Dr. Aleem And if you go to metaphysically, um, the metaphysical end of religious confusion, you will see Sister Sasha Long up there on the uh, right hand side um, in the yoga position with her hands in the prayer uh, position there um, um, doing her thing. And uh, mm-hmm. the article talks about the fact of the religious confusion um, ending, you know, within um, with the science of metaphysics. You know, um, and showing how the symbolism in which that we have seen throughout history, based on Matsunata, based on the different other um, writers on the wall, as we would say, or the scripts, you know, whether it's from the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Spanish Shah, the Holy Quran, um, the um, um, the Vesta, um, Vesta, uh, Vesta the Vesta, the or the uh, Five Buddha, um, um, the Five Baskets of Buddha, you know, or whatever the case may be, um, it all talks about the signs of the human body. The uh, physiology, the anatomy, um, the temple of God, and uh, what you must do in order to preserve it. And so, of course, we you know, like in First Corinthians three sixteen, it speaks about do you not know that you are the temple of God? You know, mm-hmm. and um, and do you not know that God dwells within His temple? You know, in which that because God dwells in the temple, you was you know you was bought at a price, and therefore you must glorify God in your body. You know. And if you do not glorify God in your body, then you will suffer the consequences because the exactly. consequence is of the physical body. You yeah. know, so obviously we have the chance, just like the scripture speaks about, of being able to live immort- immortal, you know, to become immortal while in flesh. You know, there's a science to it. And so that's what we're also going to be um, speaking about, too. I mean, it comes through the science of breath. It comes through the proper foods. comes through the proper drink. So mm-hmm. um, we just to say that before we close out. And we appreciate each and every one of y'all. Thank you, um, God, and Sasha Long for coming on and breaking that information down for the Melanin Center Longevity Conference, as well as also um, Grand Sheik, Professor L, for um, coming on and being the co-host, as usual, you know, getting down to the top of And uh, we appreciate both y'all, and we're going to see everyone here next Wednesday. Yes, sir. Bless it. Peace. 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 Peace and love. <laughs> Peace and love. It's long. Peace and love. First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building 
on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in levels in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. <laughs>